time may not be ceded to another speaker. Comments are to be addressed to me, the board chair, or the board as a whole, not to any individual on the board, on the staff, or in the public. Please raise your hand and wait to speak until you are asked to by myself. Please identify yourself with your first and last name and your town of residence. Please refrain from restating comments that have already been shared. You can certainly express agreement with those comments. Order and decorum shall be observed by everyone. Shouting and profanity are prohibited. As the board chair, I will maintain the order and decorum of the meeting. And with that, I open up public comment. Yes. Hi, my name is Haley Larry. I live in East Brookfield, Vermont. Um, I have a document that I'd like everyone on the board to look at, if you could pass around. It's longer than three minutes, so I have a summary of what this um, document is. So good evening. Again, my name is Haley. I am a social emotional team member at Randolph Elementary and have been for the past four and a half years. My job consists of supporting students grades K through six throughout the day, giving positive breaks to students as well as supporting staff in the building with what they need. At Randolph Elementary, I have been able to build meaningful and trustful relationships with our students, families, and staff. On, mo on Monday, October 23rd, my coworker, who's with me today, and I had a scheduled meeting with Superintendent Lane Millington and others to discuss ways to problem solve Rule 4500 incidents. The purpose of Rule 4500 in the state of Vermont is to, quote, create and maintain a positive and safe learning environment in schools, promote positive behavioral interven interventions and supports in schools, and to ensure that students are not subjected to inappropriate use of restraint or seclusion, end quote. When walking into that meeting, it was the pure opposite of problem solving and strategizing 4,500 4, procedures. Without explanation, Lane Millington just played a video of an intervention that happened among me and a coworker and an escalated student outside at recess on September 26, 2023. As the video plays with no sound, he is falsely narrating the situation. He is also falsely stating how the student is feeling, whom he can't even name nor has ever met. He asks for no context about the situation. He just assumes the worst. He goes on and continuously shames my coworker and me during this meeting that lasts two hours. I asked Superintendent Millington to come observe my position for one day, but he stated that it was not his role. As a superintendent, it is his role to oversee and collaborate with his staff on policies, implementations, and outcomes. It is his job as the district leader to oversee day-to-day -day operations at a school, and since this is a developing policy that he is implementing into our building, it is his job to be present and see what my job entails to make sure these policies make sense and are safe for staff and all students so that they can receive a right to their education. As someone who is from this community and has been with these students as well as supported these students and families for years, I am disappointed with how my coworker and, I, coworker and I were treated by him. It was wrong. Lastly, another role he has as superintendent is to ensure a positive and effective work, env effective work environment, which on that day he failed to provide. Furthermore, Mine and my colleagues' experience in the 3.45 p.m. 4500 meeting yesterday proved his inability to foster a positive and effective work environment under the treatment of staff policy. I will be making a formal complaint. Um, I uh, uh, appreciate audible and, and physical support for comments, but let's try to keep them, uh, let's try not to do them, because if we did them after every comment, which every comment deserves, we, we'd be here for quite some time. Um, anyone else? Yes. Thank you. Hi. My name is Nora Smolnik. I am a resident of Braintree. And I am a teacher at RES. I'm also the vice president of our association. I'm not sure where I'm supposed to stand for it. That's great. OK, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to express our concern for two of our professional staff 
who have been, had their <coughs> professionalism questioned and don't feel at this point supported and, um, and that also describes a lot of how the majority of our staff at RES is feeling at this moment. I want to thank um, Superintendent Millington for the meeting yesterday and for some of the clarifications that he was able to give us on the policies that we have in order to deal with some very disruptive and difficult student behaviors. At the same time, this is a beginning, it is a first step, and we have a long way to go. Um, we have some asks that we would like the board to consider, and we felt the need to come tonight, not only in support of our colleagues, um, but to work as a community to deal with the situation, and to hear, have the board hear firsthand what that situation is, since we are the ones that are experiencing this on a daily basis. Our first ask is that we continue to do the work on the action plan, which was a draft, and that as a draft, it needs a lot of revision and a lot of work. I think um, our superintendent would be in agreement on this. Our second ask is that we have comprehensive training for all staff, and that training happened during the school day or on paid time, and that that training be live and in person. As educators, we know the value of having in-person training for something, not watching a video, not having it remote, where we can ask questions, have clarifications, and um, practice some of the techniques that need to be um, worked on. We also are asking that we have re-entry plans for all students who have been physically aggressive with another staff member or with a another student before that child is re-entered into the classroom. At that re-entry meeting or to create that re-entry plan, we need to have all stakeholders involved. That includes parents, that includes teachers, special educators, interventionists, and our social and emotional learning team. We are also asking that we have alternative placement options for students that are in district. We have a person in our school who was hired to do this exact position, um, but we have not yet been able to have that. So we would like to have that, as this is not appropriate for all students in our school. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to the one person who had their, their hand up and then I'll come back. Uh, Lindsay. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is Lindsay Hopped. I am calling in from Braintree. I'm calling um, to just, rec I have seen that there is conversation around the renewal of the current superintendent's contract. And I appreciate that there's a large portion of that that is personnel and not something that can be shared. Um, I just like to take the time to remind um, the board to please review the petition that was signed by over 400 district members um, requesting that we consider non-renewal at this time. Um, I'm aware that the board has spent an extensive amount of time creating new evaluation techniques and I applaud that. I think they will be wonderful moving forward with whomever our superintendent is. Um, but I fear that we are going to move forward with three years of rehabbing a superintendent as opposed to three years of starting to rehab our district. And somebody who grew up here and has always been proud of our community, um, I'd like to get back to that point. And I think there's a lot of people who are struggling to feel the heart of our community. And I think some of that comes from leadership or lack thereof. And so um, hearing what I just heard from a staff member kind of just reinforces more of that. And so I'm just really hoping the board will remember that any one of you holds the right to make a motion to not move forward with further um, contract renewal and instead start thinking about what we can really do to move our district in a positive place. Um, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate all the time you school board members put in. I know none of us on this phone can imagine the extra hours you put in, but please hear those of us that asked you to be there and recognize we really need a change. <laughs> and we need it now. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Kata Ruiz. I am a resident of Randolph Center, and I am a special educator at RES. Um, as Nora stated, there was someone who was hired to do the alternative placement, and that's me. Hi. Um, when I was hired, I was told that there was a high need in the, in the community and that the wait list and alternative programs are extremely high and that in-house we can create a program that serves the needs for the kiddos that don't really function well in mainstream schooling. When I joined RES, that was not the case. I have had the honor and privilege of working behind the SEL team, including Mike Haley, Mike Haley and Sonia. Deb and Natalie, and they are the most professional, amazing superheroes that we have in this community. Without them, RES would fall apart. They are the glue that keeps our community together. They check on staff, they check on students, they create that safe place that school should be for students, especially the students who we have who are lower income and have trauma. Because of the lack of guidance and leadership that we've had, in the building, not due to our principal. Our principal, Melinda Robinson, has been incredible in helping us and guiding us. We have had situations that make me very uncomfortable working there every day for the safety of the staff and the students. We had an incident the other day due to the um, guidance from Superintendent Lane in Millington. We, had, we were told that we could not go hands-on and that we cannot use seclusion unless it is a imminent threat. The other day, we had a kindergartner walk outside the building towards the main street. Now, in normal safe cases, any child, any parent would stop that child and take them away from that main street. However, because of that, we had three staff members, including myself, the kindergarten teacher, and Mike, stand in the main street blocking traffic and hoping that the kindergartner would not cross. That is a situation that no student and no staff should have to be privy to. We were lucky and fortunate enough that the student had decided to take a seat and slowly move back towards the building. But that was the best case scenario. These are things that are happening in our school and we want things to change, to feel safe for the staff and for the students. And we ask the board to please hear us. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, someone's pointing me over here. Yes, sorry. Um, so, my name is Lisa Wright. I'm co-president for the support staff. Um, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the paras. My job as a building para, I go in, I sub, I do anything else that needs to be help, done. I've even helped my, Mike and Haley. Um, and whatever else. I have watched and I have witnessed students screaming at the paras, at the teachers. I have watched and I have witnessed where they have picked up a desk, they have thrown it. They destroy the classrooms. Then the teacher has to remove the classroom while the student is still inside being disruptive and throwing things. Um, the paras are the first people that these students go after. I have had, whereas the staff in the office, we've had many paras that have come, they've been crying, they want to quit. And without the help of the office and their supporters, they're still there. But I'm afraid that if you guys don't do something, you will not have any parents. They're the front people. They're the ones that are with these students 26, six hours a day. They need the help. Not yesterday, they need it today. <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. Yes. Uh, my name is Sean McAnulty. I'm a teacher at RES. I'm a community member of Randolph, and I am a future parent of an RES student. My son is almost three. He's going to start pre-K in our building next year. 
Uh, in my 12 years of working in elementary schools, I've taught in four school districts in three different states, and in my mind, RES stands out in the support that is in place for the students that need it the most. It didn't take me very much time at all when I started teaching here last year to be impressed by Mike and Haley. RES is incredibly lucky to have their experience, their knowledge, their compassion, their understanding, and their expertise, and they bring that to our building every single day. There are no easy jobs in a school, and they have willingly accepted the toughest ones. I have been nothing but impressed with their empathy, with their patience, with their professionalism that they bring on a daily basis. They are some of the most loved staff members in our building, and that is no coincidence. I hope that they both know that all of the teachers and staff in our school support them, but it breaks my heart to know that their professionalism and their commitment to doing what is best for kids could ever be questioned. I've worked with a lot of educators, and I can say without a doubt that these people set a high bar of excellence. Before I started teaching, I would not have believed the impact that an individual could have on a larger group, but anyone who spent any amount of time in a school can tell you that's true. And the kids that this team works with on a daily basis and the way that they interact with them play a huge role in shaping the culture and the climate and the mood of the entire school. If you know someone that spends time in the school, then you know someone that's been impacted by the work that they do. I want to applaud the SEL team for their tremendous commitment to maintaining the dignity of all students, especially when they're at their lowest, and that is no easy feat. You would only need to follow them around for a day to see this, to see what they do, to see the challenges they face, and the unbelievable grace that they manage to maintain while doing it. If my, was, my, my son was in school today and for whatever reason was struggling, I would not hesitate to trust that either one of them would interact with him in a way that keeps him safe and has his best interest at heart. It feels like the school is at a tipping point and this team and the kids that they serve are at the center of it. It feels like there's a tremendous opportunity here to meaningfully rethink the way that these kids move throughout our system, and I hope that we do not fail them. I hope that we decide that they are worth it. Five seconds. This is really hard work, and we're lucky to have this, these amazing educators. Let's listen to them, let's lift them up, and let's not get in their way. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Um, yes, my name's Gabrielle Pisani. I'm a kindergarten teacher um, at Randolph Elementary. I'm also a parent of a child in Mr. McAnulty's class. <laughs> um, um, I just want to um, talk about, there's a lot of emphasis from the higher administration on data and achievement scores and helping kids be successful in the classroom. I would like to highlight that that data exists because of the SEL team. They are an integral part of allowing us teachers to continue teaching the content when a child in our classroom is spiraling to a point where we either need to clear the classroom or take different measures. They come in, they de-escalate, I can continue, I can engage with my kids, the kids in the classroom are not scared, the child who has had the issue can exit get back into a place where they're ready to re-enter and be successful as well. They are absolutely an integral part of the data that us teachers can produce with our classrooms. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cecile Smith. I'm a nearly lifelong resident of Randolph and um, I also teach at Randolph Elementary School, actually in the, cl the classroom I had as a kid. So this place is really special to me. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how lucky I feel to get to work with Mike and Haley and the whole SEL team. Um, Mike and Haley are both highly skilled first responders in, their, in our school. And they don't only support children across the day and in moments of crisis. These two professionals also help staff members in navigating the emotional terrain of the children we all work with. We have really hard jobs and Haley and Mike are crucial to what we all do. 
Um, Haley and Mike are integral to the staff's ability to respond compassionately to children in moments of crisis. Both of these professionals have been an invaluable resource to me and many, many others, including people in this room, um, in their professional learning at our school. Haley and Mike, when possible, make themselves available to support teachers when we are struggling with challenging behaviors in our classrooms. Their support of and compassion for both staff and students are a big part of why I choose to work at Randolph Elementary School. There are myriad ways that they help and support our school community. These two professionals are the backbone of Randolph Elementary School. Mike and Haley have our trust as staff. They have our respect. And I would hope that they have the same trust and respect from our district's administration. My name is Julie Bristol, and <clears throat> I'm a special educator at Randolph Elementary. I am very new to Randolph Elementary School this year. I have lived in Randolph for two years, and part of the reason I took a job there was to become a bigger part of the community. I wanted to be able to teach and help children in this community. I think one thing that has struck me and it feels really difficult is the climate in the school. It's extremely challenging. Staff are having such a difficult time coping with all of the behaviors and feeling that they are not having the support they need from district administration. I've had several teachers who have come to me and said, I don't know what to do anymore. And I've been in their classrooms and the behaviors are astounding. Teachers who are in tears almost every day, I had to go in, I didn't have to, I was in a class the other day, the teacher was expressing what a difficult time she was having. I said, take five minutes and I will stay in here. There are teachers who every day are saying they don't know how they can keep coming in. They're not sure if they can come back next year. I don't know if people understand what a phenomenal group of people you have at Randolph Elementary School who are pushing themselves day after day to give the very best of themselves to try to support each other. I feel so fortunate to have the team that I have in the kindergarten wing and the other teachers and I can't even begin to talk about Mike and Haley and Deb and Natalie and Sonia and the people who are every day in the thick of it with behaviours. I myself have to help with behaviours in my role which takes away from my time that I should be doing paperwork because there are children breaking down all the time, every single day. What I would like to see is that there is respect and that there is a sense that the people who work in this school are valued for the work they do. And even if there is the perception that there is a problem with the way that something is being done, what I would prefer to see is that there is kindness and that there is the assumption that best intentions were in the minds of those who are doing the work. I saw some things yesterday that disturbed me greatly in terms of how situations were handled. Um, I would like to see things change dramatically for the better. going to say that if it wasn't for Mike and Haley, my kids would not be there and they would not be flourishing. Um, for anyone that knows me, I, I am a resident of Randolph and I'm a foster parent who was adopted. Three of my kids that are at RES. Um, I have an older son that was adopted that I actually pulled from the high school, which is a different story. Um, my three littles at RES come from a background of trauma. They also are typical young children <coughs> and they have their slew of issues, but each and every day they go to school, and you know who they're excited to see besides their main teachers? It's Mike and Haley. They come home and they talk, Mr. Mike, Miss Haley. 
and they're not only there for my kids, but they're there for me. And I will say that I had a very negative experience with one of my children um, in, a, in a preschool at Braintree. Um, and getting to know RES, um, I had mixed emotions and I really didn't want to send my kids to school at all. Um, coming from a trauma background, fostering them and adopting them and know what they came from, to send them off to a building when they've already gone through such trauma was extremely difficult for me. And so, and my wife ultimately chose to send them and put them in the hands of these educators. And I will tell you, it's been amazing. Now my kids are only in preschool and kindergarten, so they have a long way to go. But I will tell you that each and every day, it is their main teachers, their paras, and most of all, Mike and Haley, that help them get through the day. And help me know that they are safe and that they're loved and cared about and that I'm cared about and my opinion matters. And I will also say that two out of my three at RES have had to go in quiet spaces and to be restrained for various reasons that I will say are no one's business, but I'm okay with that because I know at the end of the day they're doing it to keep my kids safe. And if tomorrow my kids had to be restrained by Mr. Mike or Haley, I would tell them to do it because I know that they're doing it out of caring and love. And I will also say the story that someone shared of the child running into the street, I would be appalled if I found out that my kid did that and they were not allowed to put their hands on my child to protect my child. So this is very concerning to me. And I will just say again, I would give anything to Mr. Mike and Ms. Haley for everything they do for my children and for the children at RES. Thank you. <clears throat> no hands up online. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Emily McCall. Um, <clears throat> I have been a lifelong resident of Brookfield um, and then uh, Braintree most recently. I have a very unique relationship with Haley. Um, I've known Haley for over 16 years. Uh, we went to high school together. My sister was in her class, uh, you know, birthday parties, sporting events. We basically grew up together. My oldest son, Nicholas, had a very horrific childhood that was, uh, it was very traumatic for him. Um, Haley was his saving grace. We've known Haley in her professional role since my son was seven years old. He is now 12 and a seventh grader at Randolph Union. Haley was the first one-on-one -on -one that was able to connect with my son and let him know that he was safe. Um, to this day, they've got a bond like this. Um, the, th the things that I would like to highlight are <coughs> Haley's professional experiences. <coughs> she started with my son at the Beckley Day program. I'm not sure if you guys know what that is, but it's a trauma-informed therapeutic school based out of Washington County Mental Health. The reason that my son had to go there was because he was expelled from kindergarten. Because his IEP that was done by Miss Susan, uh, Miss Lancy, many moons ago, did not get pulled over. It was not honored, which we all know was illegal. Uh, he was expelled. He went to Beckley Day program and thank God every day we met Haley there. Um, she was able to get Nick to the point where he did not need to be restrained. She helped him learn coping skills so that he could regulate himself. I don't know what we would do if we didn't have Haley in our lives. She followed Nick from Beckley Day program when he was in first grade to Brookfield Elementary where he finished second and third grade. Then she helped him transition to Braintree Elementary when we bought our home. She has been with my son every step of the way and I trust her implicitly. Um, I know that her background working at uh, you know, trauma-informed schools they are taught the safe ways to restrain, the safe ways to de-escalate situations. You are way over. Sorry, I lost my Oh, that's okay. <laughs> anyway, I, I can't say enough over. good things about Haley, and um, I just wanted to let you know we're here, we support you, and thank you for everything you've done. Thanks.
My name is Sonia Katna, and I'm the school counselor at the elementary school. I'm a resident of Waterbury. Um, so first of all, I want to say I'm glad that there's a draft of an action plan. I think that that's a really good step going forward, and it's an important one that we need throughout our school. Um, so it did state in the opening paragraph, quote, it was created through the input of those who work closely with our most challenging students, end quote. And I just want to point out that not one member of our social emotional learning team was part of that, collaborated with that, just part of that process. Um, I also take offense um, that Mr. Millington has said that Mike and Haley dysregulate kids and they were treated very unfairly and not collaboratively at a recent meeting that they were at, <coughs> that we had talked about. Um, in my 19th year of working at RES, um, Mike and Haley are the most skillful, empathetic team members who create incredible relationships um, with our students, and we are so lucky to have them. I, I can't imagine working with better colleagues. Thank you. Okay, back there. Uh, hi, I'm Jenny. I'm a teacher here at, at RTCC, but I'm talking as a parent today. Um, I'd like to say my experience from the other side as a child who has been, uh, I don't know, bullies, not quite the word, but has had attacks on him. And the fact that people, I'm hearing that people are not allowed to restrain children in safe, healthy ways really, really makes me nervous. My son has come home a couple times saying that he's been punched in the stomach this does not leave bruises, this does not leave bleeding, there's no evidence. But to know that a, a personnel cannot come and restrain him is very, very, very concerning. So just the other side of somebody who is dealing with, uh, I don't know, what's it called, <laughs> like attack is just really concerning. And then also the other thing is I have another daughter who is very well behaved and her experience is that there are times when kids are dysregulated and the teacher needs to be involved with them and they're, like these good children are getting ignored because all of the effort is on these other children who need extra help. So, and also Mr. Mike's also. My son <laughs> talks about him all the time. <laughs> Very positive male role model. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna go over here and then I'll be back here. My name is Molly Mullen. I'm a forever resident of Randolph. Um, wasn't going to speak, but I am so moved by everybody. Um, I am a staff member, but most importantly, a parent of two children at the elementary school. And I'd love to piggyback off what Jenny said um, about the, you know, 90% of the students in the school who don't have trauma or behavioral issues and how concerned I am as a parent knowing what I know working at the school that those kids are severely losing out on an education. Our teachers and the SEL team do a fantastic job of trying to keep classrooms normal and regulated but it's the kids who have problems that get all the help, which in turn pushes the rest of our kids to the side. Um, we need people like our SEL team to keep our classrooms together so that my two children can have the best education they can get. Um, I trust Mr. Sean, my son's teacher, and the SEL team to put my kids who don't have behavioral issues, their needs first. Um, and they do a great job. But they're also but there's only so much they can do before they get pushed to the wayside. And my son's needs are just as important as those kids. Um, and I will say, 
if this if the community knew half of what goes on they would be appalled at what their kids have to deal with on a daily basis how many times their kids classrooms get cleared how many times things get thrown at them and I think it would be really important that the community be privy to that knowledge when it happens because you would really see the hard work and dedication our SEL team puts out to try to stop those before they, it even happens. Um, and I fear that if we lose our SEL team, that it's just going to get worse. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Megan Westbrook. I am a longtime resident of Randolph, and I'm a parent of three kids at RES kindergarten, second grade, fourth grade. I'm also currently working in the school as a long-term sub with special ed. Um, so I have both perspectives, and I just want to like kind of piggyback on both what Jenny and Molly have said. I think especially what Molly just ended with, which is that if parents in the community, and I'm like looking at the board thinking, have any of you actually worked in the school? Have you subbed? Have you spent any time in any of the classrooms? I really encourage you, go to the school during the day. Spend some time in the school. I knew what I was going into working there as, like, I, like I've lived in Randolph for a long time. I, I know the community really well. And I have little kids. But honestly, it's eye-opening. It is, there's so much going on in the school. It is volatile at times. Um, it can feel unsafe for staff and students. And this team is amazing. They're so impressive, all of them, include obviously, you guys, like the SEL team's amazing, but everyone, paras, like the, the ladies who work in the front office, like every single teacher is there and they're working their butts off every single day. And honestly, I don't even know if they do it. I don't know when they come back like Friday morning after like everything that they've done. But um, I really encourage you, get in, get in the classroom and see what's happening. Our kids, all needs should be met. All kids needs should be met. I have a kindergarten kindergartner who was in the kindergarten class that Katya was just talking about, where there was a, a student who ran from the building. The amount of staff needed to corral that one kindergartner, imagine the time that was taken up, just that one situation, while my kindergartner was in a class without the teacher. Like there was learning lost in that time. So I just I just want to say, get in the classroom, sub for a day, just even one day. Choose a class and sub, and just see it from your own perspective seriously. Thank you. I believe I have someone online. We have yep. someone online. Uh, Felicia. Sorry, I had a couple unmuting. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we could. <laughs> Hold on. There She's you still are. here, right? Yeah, she's still here. <laughs> I'm trying to play a recording. Um, hold on. <laughs> Look, Felicia, I'm I'm going to see if there are other comments in the room, but I'm not disregarding you. Are there um, other? Sure. Yep. I just say that I sent the recording to the board. Um, if they could play it, it probably the audio would be better. Please. Uh. Technologically, I'm not sure how we would do that. Um, you want me to get my laptop out? You might be able to get it on the phone. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, well, I, I wonder uh, about this, though. I mean, you're, you're present. This, so playing a recording... Um, Wow, I'm looking for guidance from board members. I just want to make sure we're doing the right thing in terms of what we allow for public comment. Yeah. 
great. Thank you, Bree. Rachel, did you have, what? Did you have something? No. Um, okay. So, well, are there are are there more comments in the room? Okay. Yes. So, Felicia, we're gonna just hold on this for a moment. Oh, well, you may have disappeared. My Go name ahead. is Mike Dooley. I'm a resident of of uh, Randolph. I've worked at RES for the last three, two years plus this year. Um, <clears throat> I, I really only want to say two things. One is we have made repeated requests to the special education director who is responsible for training for physical interventions to revisit how the district does that. In the three years that I've received the trainings, not a single training has not involved watching a video. When I trained Handle with Care for Claire Martin Center, it was a two-day training. That's the minimum that someone would need. When I brought to the attention of the special education director that we are no longer certified, I was told CPI does not require yearly recertifications. The truth is, if you call CPI, which I've done, CPI is the one we use at Randolph. Crisis Prevention Intervention, I believe. Uh, they, they were quick to tell me that the instructors are every two years and that the district should be providing every six month training and that if the district provides every six month training, we do not have to have a recertification. I've only ever had a video. I have never actually been allowed to practice the CPI moves with a human being. The second thing I want to say is that the only question <coughs> Superintendent Millington has ever asked me in the time that I've worked, and I racked my brain trying to think of any question besides potentially, how are you, when he's greeted me, is if I would like to watch the tape the video of our intervention that my colleague uh, alluded, brought up in front of my entire faculty body. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I am going to look in my email. Um, since we do have an agreement um, from last year with our council, I'm looking at you because I'm sure you're going to remember that we do, we can read email, public yeah. comment that we've received. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't see a reason why you can't play that. <clears throat> okay. Let me. It may be the person just was uncomfortable saying it out loud. And okay. They wanted to do a recording, I think it's fine. All right. Good evening, board and guests. My name is Felicia Allard. I'm here before you tonight as the former director of the Randolph Technical Career Center and as a parent with two children in this district one at the elementary school and one at the high school. I'm here because I have grave concerns about the top leadership of this district. Due to my separation agreement, I am, un I am unable to speak publicly to my employment history at RTCC, but I would like the board to consider an exit interview with me, and this is my formal request for one. I want to point out that the separation agreements seem to be the way that problems are solved in this district versus dialogue and collaboration. I am not the first one to be coerced into a separation agreement. And when disagreement occurs again, unchecked, I will not be the last. What I am most concerned about here is that up until recently, we have only heard from a select few voices. I'm pleased the board is reviewing policy to obtain more oversight. However, notoriously missing are the voices of the majority of parents, students, staff, and administrators who have left the district under Lane's leadership. 
I can tell you that in my 27 years in education, my time in this district was the most challenging of my career. It'd be easy to assume that this is because of the pandemic, but it is not. It is because of the mismanagement of this district, specifically lack of instructional leadership from the top, supervision of district level employees, and accountability for adults to behave in the ways in which we expect our kids to. Now, as a mom, I've looked into school choice to allow my child to be in an environment that focuses on learning. It's not normal for kids to pee on the floor. It's not normal for sinks to be ripped off the walls. It's not normal to have the amount of bullying and harassment that exists in these schools. It is not normal for these problems to have grown to the levels that they have. I would make the case that our district leadership intentionally creates divisiveness to keep eyes off the real problem. The amount of upper level disrespect for staff and students is astonishing. No wonder our students are angry, our staff are burnt out, and we've had 100% administrator turnover. I would ask the board to consider what has happened in the last six months. I've been contacted by two separate groups to complete a survey and a petition. This community wants to be heard. These, this staff, these students, and our community have realized that Lane Millington's leadership is toxic for this district, and it is holding our kids back. The root of the problem is at the supervisory level, specifically Lane Millington and Heather Lawler. I would ask that this board not renew their contracts. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it, it, it is um, 6.50 and we have a full agenda, so I'm going to call public comment closed now. Um, a reminder from the preamble, I, I read that the board cannot respond to any, but I will say thank you for being here and we invite you to all of our meetings um, and to contact us uh, by email. Our board emails are available on the, on the website. Um, so thank you. Next agenda item. And you're also welcome to stay. I didn't. Yes, the sign in book for anyone who's not staying. Um, please make sure you sign in. We need public record of attendance. Thank you. It looks like it's over here um, near this other screen. Do you need it? Uh, at this point, oh, if I needed to add something to the agenda, I needed to have done it before public comment. It's usually the first act, of, but okay. I, since you haven't conducted any real business yet, you probably Okay, because we needed to get the, uh, a request onto the agenda um, that's not there now. So, what's your name? We have it separately printed, right? Or did it make it into the packets? This is just Kyle. Did the new um, uh, request that I needed to add to the agenda? Did it make it into the main packet? I emailed Yes. I think that's, I think I emailed it to everyone and did not. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm just going to RTC. My apologies. Oh, There's a facilities request. Um, do we have? We don't have it printed. No. Okay. So. My apologies. No. Thank you. Thank you. It's not a. It's not a critical. One. So if we had to wait a month, that's fine. Could we only because I'm not sure everyone's had a chance? I mean, yeah, no, it, it right came late from facilities, so it's probably fine. Okay. Um, if we need to call a special meeting, if you can spend your time, can certainly do that. So um, we're going to move on to uh, discussing the annual report to voters. Um, this is uh, something that goes in the town annual report, and we put it together um, every year. And in the previous years, we have had help from them. Yes, right? Yeah. Yes. I know we did last year. Um, I don't know if you, yep, Tom. I was just going to say, I'd like to make, um, I don't know if I need to make a motion, but I'd like to see if we can move the 
or if it's okay if we move the RUHS presentation up, just because we do have our staff here mm -hmm. and, to, and to honor their time. Oh, that's um, a great idea. I, I, do so I need a motion? motion? I do. I'll make a motion. Great. Sure. Make a motion to move that um, up on the agenda, please. I second it. Okay. Seconded by Chelsea. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Katya. That's very thoughtful of you. Um, so, at this moment, I would love to invite uh, the presentation to begin. Okay. Join Thank us, please. Much. Give me just a second, because I'm trying to load your presentation. Okay. Do you guys want chairs at the table? No. You want to stand? I mean, I think okay. we can stand. Right? Okay. We're a small group. You use my computer, too, if you need. We'll be Give me a second here. To get Thank you. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, present. I was looking for a presentation in our colors. It's a little splashy, but. It's <laughs> It is showing up, right? Yep. Um, but it's on like the eight slide, not like slide number one. We'll be quick. Um, this is just an overview. Go. Thank you. Then you can uh, some of the things that we've been up to this school year. So, thank you for giving us this opportunity to present to all of you. Um, I really appreciate being able to talk about the work that we're doing. Uh, we still have areas to improve, and we are, you know, looking at data all the time and talking to our students and our staff and learning the ways in which we can continue to grow. Um, can I touch this to move forward, or do we? You can try. Okay. I don't think it'll I work. It's not going to work. Just because it's okay. there we go. Um, so we just wanted to do a quick overview of some of the areas that we're really focused on this school year. And then um, we'll go a little bit deeper as we move into the presentation. So we're going to talk about increased time on learning, data-driven decision making, ensuring that we know all students well, um, the celebrations that we have planned to acknowledge growth and success, and also some of our work addressing student behavior. Um, so increased time on learning, as some of you, uh, well, probably all the board members, but people in the audience are aware that this year we switched to a waterfall schedule. And what this allowed us to do are primarily, the reason for looking at changing the schedule was increasing instructional time on learning. Uh, through the small adjustments in our schedule, we added 47 hours of instructional time this school year, which is a significant amount of, of time on learning that we've added. Um, and that's not including instructional time that happens during callbacks, advisories, or after school programming, and I'll touch on those all as well. Um, so how it currently looks is we have two uh, blocks static in the morning of our seven blocks throughout the day. Uh, then the, the remaining five blocks rotate. So all classes meet four times. And why that's important is, you know, when we talk about time on learning, best practice is also uh, increasing the frequency of learning. So you're not having this big chunk of time, and if we have a Friday off for some reason, that student might be almost, you know, five days away, then you're kind of spending the entire class period relearning what you've missed um, because of a time gap and loss. So that frequency of learning is important um, in addition to the actual time on learning. Um, feedback we've gotten from students is that it is a little bit challenging when you have a waterfall schedule where every single day after your second block, your schedule is a little bit different. Um, so it, it flows through. But what we've heard from students is that they actually, um, everything's really positive. They like the variety in their day. Um, teachers have given us positive feedback. At first, there was a little hesitation about how this might look. Uh, teacher feedback has been positive in that they find that students are more engaged when they're in class um, and they're not falling into poor routines of Oh, every last block, the last 10 minutes of class, school's almost out. Um, that's spread across, you know, all five days. So that kind of helps establish the routines um, before lunch, after lunch, you know, those kind of times where sometimes we historically have seen legs in learning. Um, teacher feedback has been students are more engaged throughout the entire time. Plus, it's a little less than an hour-long block. So they're not trying to stretch out some of the swimming into an hour and a half. Um, Extension classes are also something new this year, and so we're working to support students in ELA and math particularly. We have 32 students in ELA, about 60 in math, put my reading glasses on here, and these are blocked out as a class that meets four times a week. Um, and these are skills-based. They're not 
a homework help or catch up from other classes kind of help. These are, these are classes that are populated based on star testing or teacher recommendations. And students can test out of these if they can show that they're meeting proficiency in these areas that, um, where they have some weaknesses. Uh, callback time, so this isn't new, but I wanted to mention this because I think it's an important part of, of our school culture and how we do things. So the most recent student engagement survey, which just came out um, about a week ago, 85% of students self-report that I use my callback well. And so what we use this for is enrichment. So AP classes often need that time um, for uh, providing additional instruction. Science labs are providing that time. Remediation happens in that time for some students. This is an extension time, but this is a time where students who need the extra support are given an hour a week to work with individual teachers. And again, this isn't calculated into that 47 hours extra um, throughout the year. This is time that learning is happening, but we don't count it in because there's that variability. Um, after school programming is another time where, you know, thankfully because of the late bus is happening five times a week, uh, we're providing more increased time on learning. And again, this isn't counted towards that additional $47 either, but it is happening. It's, so if you look across the school, we're adding more and more opportunities for learning and time on learning. Um, actually, as I was walking down my, the hall today, a couple of students were sitting in the hallway and like, just saying how much they love this opportunity to be able to stay after school. Two of the biggest draws are our theater program and our dance programs. And so we have a number of students uh, participating. Though I think there's 18 students in the dance class. I'm not sure how many in the theater, but it's comparable. So we have a lot of students participate in that, which also gives them time to take some of those core academic classes that they might have to choose between theater or algebra, or, right? So like, it gives them more time on learning because we have this additional learning opportunities after school. Um, and again, that's not calculated into it. We're starting our homework club potentially next week as uh, still more time on learning, which is how we get things done. Um, so here's a little bit about our data decision, data driven decision making. So star tests are given on a regular basis. Those are tests that um, scale with the VCAP or VCAP testing. They changed the names like three times mm -hmm. while they were implementing the new test last year. Um, former, formerly, we had given SBAC tests, and so STAR is a pretty reasonable predictor of how students will do on those tests. So students who are functioning below proficiency um, or showing that they're partially profi proficient in ELA or math with a teacher recommendation are um, scheduled into an extension class so that they can work on some skill development. At the middle level, we had seven students already who've tested out of that class, so they're graded classes, um, and they get tested a little bit more frequently. So there's flexibility so that if there is just an area that they're struggling to learn, they get really targeted intervention with their classroom teacher, and then they have an opportunity to go into an elective or something of their choice once they show that they've developed the skills we're hoping to see them develop. Um, the goal is to have students working on grade level, you know, we know at the middle and high school level that the stronger their skills are in math and literacy earlier, the more deeply they can go into science content and social studies content and really immerse themselves in learning and get the most out of their educational experience with us. So it's very important that they have the basic skills developed that they need to fully engage. Um, we have grade level team meetings scheduled into the school day. So our grade teams meet twice a week, one time a week for planning um, and, and like how they're going to integrate and how they're going to support students across their grade team and then another time to discuss student needs. So that is a time when they can review data, when they dis can discuss what they're seeing and when they can make decisions based on performance and based on the actual human children in their classroom about how they're going to proceed. Um, there are deeper learning opportunities offered to support skill development um, in, in the content and in core classes that we're proud of. And we have worked with the community a few years ago. Some of you will remember we worked with a gentleman named, gentleman named Quinton Goodrich and we did a lot of polling. <laughs> and we had information about what the community wanted. And we learned that people felt really passionately about math for everyday life or the kind of math that kids need in order to function in our world. 
as well as an on your own curriculum that used to be here um, I think 15 years ago it was a graduation requirement and people really wanted that back um, right now it's an elective but with our ninth grade class as they move up through it'll be a graduation requirement for their graduation year that's your life skills course mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. So they're working on cooking nutritious food and how to get insurance and all of those things that feel so important. Uh, development of specialized diplomas. So this is uh, something that we're primarily focusing on with our STEM uh, students, uh, students interested in that field, especially since we have such a great resource with the Innovation Center back here. Um, obviously so much invested, thank you for that. Um, but so we're trying to focus on STEM first and what a specialized diploma will look like is the student identifies a number of courses within the STEM area where it's not going to be prescribed because we want to have some choice and variability and some opportunities for flexible pathways within that. Within this menu of options, you say if you pick X amount of core courses within this STEM, you could start working towards a, a specialized, specialized diploma in STEM. In addition to those courses, we would look at some higher level learnings, independent learning opportunities, these other things that say, so now that you have this core content, what are you going to do with it? And so hopefully look at some career planning, some job shadows, maybe some um, you know, informational interviews, potentially an internship. Um, and so you have that career education and exploration part of that, as well as the higher education planning. Like, so now this is the career I want, what are some of these options of, uh, in this menu that you want to do to look at post-secondary education? So when we look at what the specialized diploma, it's not just saying, okay, you've taken these five courses, check the box. Like, so this is STEM. What can you do with it in our community? What are pathways within that field? So it's, we're excited about that. We think um, you know, it helps prom promote engagement. Um, it helps maybe encourage some of those students who are seniors who have enough credits to graduate. Like, but did you know if you took these other two classes? Or if you took this other class here, it helps promote students taking more classes um, than the other ones might not have. Um, and also looking at different opportunities within the field. Um, in addition to STEM, if, if STEM is something that looks like is going well, we would then look at humanities, um, fine and performing arts, the global studies, foreign language, uh, business and entrepreneurship, and then potentially like a self-designed. That's, that's way in advance. I won't get too ahead of myself. <laughs> Focusing on STEM, because that's really what our resources are um, here. We have such great resources and a couple of really good instructors down in the IC as well as all of our classroom teachers. Okay. I didn't mention this in uh, the after school program piece because uh, um, Nasser Abdel Fattah and Tom Zani, who are great educators in the IC, they're offering an after school programming piece um, Thursdays and Fridays for students in grades five through eight. Again, this happens after school. And if, you're around, um, you know, you're all invited to come in the classrooms, come in and see what's happening in the IC after school. It's just a hub of activity and students and they're making things on 3D printers and laser engraving. It's just a great way for some of these younger students um, to help them make that successful transition into the middle grades in high school. Um, it's just, you know, that place is hopping. I wanted to mention that because um, we feel that like that will then help encourage, you know, students to explore fields and stuff. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I found really exciting about that, and I'm not sure if you can see by this picture, is we are gradually increasing the number of girls and young women accessing our STEM programming. If you talk to some of our seventh grade girls, they are pretty excited about the STEM programming happening here. Um, and I also am really heartened on Thursday and Friday afternoons to go down there and see the level of joy in the space. Um, I've worked at this school for 23 years, um, and I have to say that for as long as I've worked here, there's been like fear of the high school, fear of the middle high school. And so to have elementary school age students coming here after school and doing things that they feel passionately about and joyful about that are academically driven is pretty exciting. Also, last week, we presented in Chelsea, they do this high school fair because they have choice. Um, so Chelsea Tunbridge do a fair and everybody sets up. And we brought some of our students and I was so proud of them talking about the learning opportunities that they have here. And also there's an outrageous amount of swag or merch that schools hand out trying to attract students. And all of ours was made by kids. We have some extra notebooks that have been laser printed that if you'd like, I can bring some in because we have some leftovers. But 
it was pretty remarkable that everything that we were given out was made by our students and designed by our students in the Innovation Center. Um, so, another thing that we're working on is advisory programming. If you've had students who've gone through our system, and if you've had multiple students who've gone through our system, you may know that um, our advisory program can be a really important part of a student's day, or it can not. And sometimes um, it depends on just the advisor that you have, and we've identified that as an area that creates some inequity because it's so person dependent. Or, for example, you might have a strong advisor who goes out on family leave, and then your student has a sub, and things sort of fall apart. So we have invested in um, the Wayfinder SEL curriculum, and that has an opportunity for students to engage with career planning, goal setting. There are um, lessons that are related to SEL, self-regulation, all of those sorts of things um, that, that help us to know what to expect in advisory and give the same tools to every advisor. So every advisory, every advisory will always be a little bit different just based on the people in the room, um, kids included. But the things that we can make more consistent help us to make a strong program. Um, twice a year we give this student engagement survey um, that we started giving last spring. And it asks questions ranging from, do you think about what you're learning in school when you're at home? Do you have conversation with your family about what you're learning about? Do you feel like your workload is manageable? What would you like to see different or what would you like to see improved at your school? Um, and do you have one trusted known adult at school? Because we know that that's so important. We've taken that data, we're just beginning to unpack it and gone to the grade teams and said, these are the kids on your teams who said they don't have an adult, who wants to put in some extra effort to make sure they have an adult. And so we'll give the survey again at the end of the year. We'll also talk to grade teams about, um, because we can disaggregate the data by grade level, so see if students aren't feeling engaged or aren't feeling passionately about what they're learning or aren't feeling like it's rigorous enough we can have conversations about how to tweak our work in order to better serve them. Um, this ties together pretty closely with um, some of the safety programming that we've been doing. Act 29 says we're going to come in and out through one door. We'll do multi-option safety drills um, and lots of different things to keep students safe. One really important part of keeping students safe is knowing them incredibly well. So um, there are reports about school safety that talk about both hardening and softening schools. The softer side is knowing your kids and knowing who's in your building at any given time. And I think our staff does a pretty remarkable job of knowing our students. Um, so we're working really hard on, on those drills and the education related to keeping our schools safe. Celebrations. Um, so our school year started rather than uh, giant assembly we did it by grade levels this year and so we could target in and focus and have more of a uh, more of a conversation with students as with, with the, by the grade level assemblies and I, we thought that was kind of a nice way to start things off and you know again you know be able to form more of a relationship with students and have them introduce to us and, and have that be an assembly um, that was maybe more meaningful to each individual student that was in there by having it smaller um, other celebrations um, at the core of who we are are student-led conferences, right? And so while that isn't um, something that is maybe acknowledged as a whole school uh, celebration for that individual student to be able to say, this is something I'm very proud of. And, and because that's what, at the end, we want students to be engaged with their learning because they're proud of the content they're producing. And so student-led conferences are a really important part of how we celebrate students um, here in our school. Um, we're also planning on bringing back uh, end of quarter assemblies. Um, for the whole school, and then using the Herald and social media to acknowledge academic achievements by our students. You know, sharing out to you know, the greater community that great academics do happen here, and you know, these are the students that we're celebrating. So we think that that's an important um, piece that we want to bring back. Um, and the big celebration that we're hoping um, that, that will happen in uh, January, towards the end of the semester, um, is a celebration of opening up the new gym. Once we have um, 
the new mascot mural up on the wall. You know, as you, I don't know if you've all seen it this already, but it's beautiful, shiny floor, bright lights. It's, it's gorgeous down there. It's, um, it's been, it was a long wait, but it's been worth the wait. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a great space down there. Um, so that's our, our next big celebration that we'll be having is the celebration of our gym, which will be open to the entire community. Yeah, we heard from a student today who was upset because the floor has gotten a little bit dirty. <laughs> 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 Ninth grade boy, deeply concerned because it's not as shiny as it was five days ago. <laughs> Um, so we're also, we, we know that there are areas of improvement. I mean, we're presenting the highlights reel, um, but I want to be really realistic about the fact that we still have work that we're doing all the time, um, from the data collection that we're doing, hearing from students, to measuring academic performance. We take all of that. that if they know what the limits are and what the expectations are, they can rise to that occasion. Um, and we provide supports to address that. Um, we are working to, to support challenging behavior with empathy, care, and education, both proactively through the social emotional learning curriculum in advisory, but then also reteaching social emotional lessons when a student you know, does what's not expected. So we have a social emotional coordinator who um, has been teaching lessons. I would say the most used lessons so far, far this school year on, are on intent versus impact. So maybe you didn't intend for that to really hurt somebody or for what you said to be um, upsetting. But if it is, then we need to think about you know how we move forward. Um, we also are having weekly Attendance team meetings, one week we review the data. Um, one of the things we know is that if students aren't here, then we can't teach them. So we look at the amount of school missed and plan proactive steps. And then next week, we pull together different members of the attendance team. Um, more, it's more of a supportive meeting. How are we going to reach out to that family? Are we going to use our homeschool coordinator and have him reach out? Are we going to work with other resources here within our school to get those students to attend more frequently? Attendance has been a real challenge as we return from the pandemic and there are some really notable successes, um, but there are also students who we don't see as often as we'd like to. So that's an ongoing concern. I what think about, that's our last what slide. What about Wayfinder? What about, oh, we mentioned that yeah. back in <laughs> advisory. I, yes. do want, I do want to mention, yep. um, I forgot to thank Bob and Wes for all the work that they did on that gymnasium, which is a tremendous amount of extra yep. hours and effort that they put into that. Yep. I think Not you there. just joined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Wes was there. Yeah. All right. So, any questions for us? I, I yeah. have a question. Um, in terms of, because you're, you're collecting data around um, the academics. I'm wondering, are you looking, as we look at engagement and we look at attendance and wanting to engage kids in the school, mm -hmm. um, are you tracking like how many kids are involved in theater stuff, how many kids are doing mm -hmm. the sports teams and just kind of, and checking, because I know sometimes, you, you know, it's the same kids doing mm -hmm. everything to sort of look, are, are we seeing like the whole community of students getting involved and, and engaging? I think that having the after school bus or the late bus has increased um, that cross section of the student population that we're seeing after school. Our athletics and activities director, Nick Bent, one of his goals is eventually to be at 80% or better of students involved in co-curricular activities or after-school activities. I believe um, the most recent number showed a 10% increase. We've been on upward, um, we've been growing in our after-school programming or our programming that connects our students to school outside of the school day since the end of the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you've noticed on this media center, center board, but we have a mega and anime after school club. 
Um, a couple weeks ago, they made mochi. They're going to make mooncakes. They're reading together. Um, we have theater. We have a variety of clubs that meet after school, a cooking club. Um, so we work really hard to help students who are inspired to develop a club or have a little friend group that they want to develop a club to connect them with an adult and make sure that we can make that club happen because we know that the more positive connections are with school, the more successful a student is as a student. Yes. A couple of questions. Okay. The student engagement survey, mm -hmm. um, that's so great. And uh, I just have a couple of questions about it. Obviously, it's not anonymous because you know which kids are right. saying yep. they don't have an adult. So what, what percentage of response are you getting? Right now, we are up around 80%. Really? Um, and uh, literally, after school today, after you know things quieted down, I went through and we noted who has responded, who hasn't yet, who's at the tech center. So we cross-referenced cross the survey with our full student roster. And so we'll start really trying to make that 100%. Um, because we can't say that all of our students have an adult in the school if we don't get the data from all of our students. Um, so cool. that's so we're, we're working on making that something that's universal. And my only other question is that you have so many teams and so many team meetings. Mm -hmm. Do you, that happens during the school day? Yes. All of those? How do you do? Uh, how, that's a lot. Um, so, <laughs> Kara Merrill is a scheduling guru. Okay. Um, I don't understand how her mind works, um, but I'm grateful that it does function the way that it does. So, <laughs> once our schedule is built, Kara looks for how to make sure there's common planning time in the day for staff members on a grade team. And um, she identifies where that spot is, and that's where the team meeting happens. Wow. So I think it's the breakfast burritos that she gets. Mm -hmm. but the right <laughs> I, I know. I've been yeah. hearing. It's got to be. Yeah. All right. I have a question just yes. about the after school program programming. Um, are there enough adults to help with that? Like, who, who are the adults that help with the clubs? Yeah. So there's different programming. Um, so we have, yes, so far they're all staffed. Um, I would love to be able to offer more, um, but we do have teachers who tutor after school. Um, and so that's really targeted in their content area. Um, we're starting the homework club, which will be Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Um, and that's more sort of general support and a place where students can either be scheduled if teachers see a need or um, or they can be they can drop in so maybe you have basketball practice at 5 30 but you're going to be here from 2 30 until 5 30 waiting you can have a snack and be with a trusted adult who's been vetted by our school system to get your homework done and just have a level of support and redirection um, around that work. So we do struggle a little bit to find people who want to extend their day, um, but we've been able to. Yeah. So. What about your summer programming? Our summer programming, we want to do more of it. Um, <laughs> we only had probably at the middle high school level, 15 or 20, not, not a ton. Uh, it was 22. 22, okay. Um, so not a lot, but we would like to increase the level of summer programming and increase access. Just so think. summer programming is like making up classes that you maybe didn't do so well in, mm -hmm. or is it like well, this summer year, camp for it's a, it's a combination. So yeah. this year, Deb Larry ran a journalism um, program. So there were some students who needed um, to spend more time writing and reading, and that provided an opportunity for them. But it also provided an opportunity for students who wanted to continue to engage with school. Um, summer vacation doesn't look the same for all kids, and sometimes they need a place to be with a trusted adult. Um, we feed them. We, we care a lot about them. So um, We'd like to make more intensive summer programming where it really could be um, 
remediation, skill development, some of those things, but also extension um, because there's a lot of learning lost over the summer. Um, and we know some kids go home and read books all summer and then they come back to school and they've got a stronger reading level than they had when they left. And some leave school and they don't read a thing all summer. They just hang out. And, and so, you know, we work with everybody. And then my final thing, I know I was a little bit critical of the student-led conferences the other day, and I do think the value that you spoke to about the student owning their experience and being proud of this and struggling with that and presenting it is a good process and it is a good thing for, it, it's, it's good. <laughs> I think what I was trying to say is that I wish there was also a place where you could talk to each teacher about mm -hmm. how your student's doing and sort of hear it presented either with your student or without just so you got a feel for how they're doing in math, science, social studies, English, like all of the things yeah. instead of just the student presenting it. Something for us to work on because well, I'm sure that you're not alone in that desire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, the attend on the attendance. What is the current policy that you guys are holding? I mean, we we just talked. To, I guess the R RTCC just transitioned and cut from twenty absences to ten, yeah. and put together a uh, engagement plan with mm -hmm. parents and folks. I think what's really hard is that we have students who really grapple with anxiety, grapple with a number of my mental health challenges. Um, the issues related to attendance can be from physical illness to, you know, worry about a parent and being, or a younger sibling. It, it's just every single story is unique, it seems like. Um, so at seven absences, we send a letter. Um, at 10, we send another letter. Um, then we send another letter at 15. And all the while, at each of these steps, we're also communicating with the family beyond just mailing a form letter and trying to figure out how we get the student to engage in school a little bit more. Um, the current fill-in state's attorney for Orange County, um, the rule has always been that we file a truancy affidavit at 20 days absent. Um, and he's really saying when attendance becomes problematic, he'd like to hear about it. And that's not so that we're holding a student accountable in a punitive way. It's because there are additional resources through the Vermont, the Orange County um, Restorative Justice Network, through, um, I know DCF has a bad name, but they have additional resources too. And so it's good to think about how we can wrap around a student and try to get them to engage with school more. So is 20 the threshold for not passing? 20 is technically the threshold for not passing, but if we can get them to re-engage in school and they're meeting proficiency, yeah. then they can still cool. they can still pass. But we need, we need to see them, we need to see the work that they're doing, and we need to get them fully re-engaged. Sure. So, so you, oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, go ahead. I'm wondering if you've considered changing your policy on that, because it seems like seven absences and just a letter it, it seems like it's a bit lenient at, without actual a direct conversation with the parent or guardian yeah so we do have direct conversations with the parent mm -hmm. and guardian the letter goes home because that's an expectation um, mm -hmm. but we also are in good communication with the family um, and we often know what the circumstances are and so we can talk about that. We think about who is the best fit to reach out to the family. In some circumstances, it's Kara, our Director of Student Services. In some circumstances, it's Colin Andresic. It depends on who we know has a trusting relationship with the family. In some situations, it's the advisor. Um, we just know that those twice a year meetings and also follow up in between is something that has meant a lot to the family. And so, we discuss who's the best person to try, you know, to take the first shot at getting them back in. So, so it's I'm trying to describe in really general terms mm -hmm. a really personalized process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. So, 
So my last question, we, as you heard, we just heard from the elementary school, a lot of staff just feeling overwhelmed and a lot of very unruly behavior that's hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you, are middle school and high school staff facing similar challenges or is it a little less volatile at this level? So at the end of last school year, we um, had a leadership team meeting and we really talked about behavior because last year we saw a lot of volatile behaviors. Um, and the metaphor that I like to use, because I taught English for a long time, um, is if those of you who took PE in a public school remember when they would get the parachute out. I don't know if any of you remember yeah. that. Um, so when you play with the parachute, if anybody drops their piece of the parachute, it's not any fun anymore. And so we've really talked a lot about collective care and how we care for each other through holding students accountable. Because what gets really hard is if one person drops their section of parachute, kids do what works for them and they know where they can sort of have more flexibility and so this year I think we're doing better um, although our discipline data because we pull the data and put it in a spreadsheet monthly and we have had a lot more pink slips at the beginning of the school year just documentation of behavior um, but the reason for that is because we want to be having conversations with students, um, talking about how we need to reset behavior, talking about how we need to know where the boundaries are, and when you cross the line, we need to be in communication with family, in communication with the student, um, and supporting teachers in holding that line, holding up their piece of the parachute. Um, it's been really challenging, but we're starting to see the number of sort of trivial things drop off, and I'm saying trivial, I don't really mean trivial, but um, Katie Vincent Roller reported last week, because Jason and I have really focused on being in the hallway and making sure students have passes, and that they're going to a specific place and they're not just hanging out in the hallway. So that can be intimidating for younger kids if there's a group of older kids sort of roaming the halls, and also they're not in the classroom learning if they're just roaming the halls. So Katie Vincent Roller came to me at the end of the day and she said the cutest moment of my day happened when an eighth grader came scurrying in the classroom and closed the door and she said what was happening and she was like his foot's coming down the hallway and I don't have a pass um, <laughs> so it was just a very innocent moment but they knew that I would ask them do you have a pass um, so we're working really hard to hold students accountable and we have had a lot of parent meetings um, because we're, we're also trying to really partner with families. We know that's what's best for kids. So how can we work with a family, be in good communication, and support their student in making good choices here at school? And Ms. Floyd brought a uh, behavior matrix this year to the, the uh, first leadership meeting. And what we ask is that teachers make that first phone call home. Right? It's like, oh, yes, this is a little level, but I'm just calling home to let you know. You know, this is what we saw today. It's not something we would expect. So rather than wait until we have this big culminating, oh, your kid has, you know, four disciplinary, you know, re referrals based on this one behavior, introduce the parents to, right away to what we're seeing and hopefully bring them into that conversation so we don't get to four or five, six, you know, DRs, disciplinary referrals. Like, let's have this conversation with the parent right away about what we're seeing and what we expect so they can then have that conversation at home with their child as well. So working in partnership with them, um, we think that's helpful in just in engaging and having those communications okay. as frequently as possible. Um, better to have a low level one than have this high level, oh, you, you know, why are you calling them? Just because my kids not in detention because they have all these things. Why didn't anyone let me know? We're asking teachers to do that and their SAL coordinator. Then, you know, once it reaches the next level, then he'll make the phone call and then we will. So we have a step process. And we've been working really hard in terms of, you know, reading about how we combat burnout and how we support people and care for people. Um, and so we've been working hard to cultivate adult community and when we have meetings, bring as much positivity and joy into those meetings as we can. So, so it's hard work. You know, we have 
students with a lot of need and a lot, you know, that they're working on. And we're still into it, so. <laughs> Great. Thank you both. Well, thank you very much. This is, um, it, it, personally, and I, I think I speak for some of you, that it's just really nice to have a conversation. We really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation. Um, and I, the, the work that goes into a presentation, even just putting it on the <laughs> screen, is enough. But then having you guys here to answer our questions and just engage with us is really cool. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, this is you. really yeah. fun to talk about, for me anyway. Um, Wayne said, eight to 12 minutes, and I was like, I bore my friends by talking about school for eight to 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Loved the Thriller video, too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Play Lauren and those kids are amazing. That was, that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. That was totally yeah. awesome. There's a display in the hallway for how to make your own zombie clothes if you need that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Patrick, thank for you. Uh, suggesting that we need that up. Um, I'm going to try to fly okay. through what we can. Like, I'm going to try to start going like this. Uh, so let's back up to the annual report to voters. I think we need to figure out what we want to do to start getting it together. It is somewhat linked with the draft letter that um, the ownership linkage committee put together. I mean, it's very, very drafty. It's a first draft. It's in your packets. Um, we kind of, oh, the minutes are in there too, just saying we discussed it. But we got together, we kind of bled out everything we thought we might want to put into the letter. Um, Obviously, that won't be in the annual report, but I think the annual report can kind of be everything we are trying to put into all of these letters that we want to then get out to the community. This isn't going fast yet, people. Help. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess the first question is, are people interested in engaging someone to help us put together what will be in the annual report to voters? Someone outside of this group of people. Have you we haven't really written that ourselves. No. Uh, no. Ben. Ben has helped. Last, last time, Ian, Ian, Chelsea and, ben. and I met. Yeah. Two years we've been doing it, right? I think. Yeah, and we just sort of highlighted the things we wanted him to, and then he put the letter together. He wrote the letter. Yeah. I was like, well. So it's it's sort of like having an AI write you a, right. a piece, yeah. and it was really it was really great. We tweaked a few things, and then and then yeah. we brought it to the board to approve. Yes. So I guess my question would be: Are we interested in that? It does have budgetary, um, you know, impact because he's now contracted rather than than being on staff. So that is something we have to you know take into, to, into consideration. But we can certainly. Take a, a if that, take a vote yeah. if we're interested in doing it that way, and then if you want to go for the trifecta third year of working with I him. I am happy to do that uh, if he if we're contracting with him. I don't want to have to write the letter myself. Reasonable. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess that's do you want to so make a motion? So I will, so yeah, entertain a motion to engage Ben now. We can do that, right? Yeah, he reached out. He was emailing with he somebody. He did, yeah. 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 No, I forgot to give us these. Um, she just gave us me the whole So I second that motion. Who made the motion? Oh, You're I making thought you. The motion. Oh, I'm making. I thought that was your informal, informal, formal motion. Um, I make a motion to engage Ben. Do I need a last name? Meryl. Meryl. And Anne Kaplan and Chelsea Sprague um, to make a letter that goes out for the annual budget. Report. Annual report. report. Reporters. Nice long motion. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Thank you. Katya seconds. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all those in favor, please aye. say aye. aye and raise your hands. Aye. aye. Thank you. Those opposed? Abstentions. Awesome. Um, ben did reach out to, I think, the three of us. but. I'll I'll write him back and say that you guys will be contacting him. Yeah. Awesome. 
All right. And is there an E on the end of your name? Because I do yes. it different every time. Yes. Thank you. Great. Uh, complaint procedure. There were a last minute, so in the packet is the brochure of the complaint procedure, and then there were some last minute flurries of we should yeah, be looking at something else. Yeah. Um, but we do need to adopt one officially. So, well, and if you want, mm -hmm. um, I can just remind the board we, we worked on it. Yeah last fall yep. and and then the board had before we um, wanted to officially have it um, in our board binder because it's in your binder um, I met with Sean at Pietro's office to just go over it and make sure everything was straight and we made a couple little things and then and then we printed it and put it in the binder, but we forgot to officially adopt it. So, um, and if that's the one we're adopting, then this brochure needs to be. Yeah, the brochure needs to be. Step ten is where I think we ran into something. The board will make a decision to resolve the complaint. We wanted that fleshed out more um, in terms of what yeah. the decision is that we would be making about you know, the, uh, was the superintendent's decision reasonable? rather than agreeing with one party or the other. Right. So in terms of adopting one, it should be the one that is in our binders. In our binders, It's a yes. separate printed, thank you, Kyle, um, board procedure for hearing complaints. And again, I think the thing that we most concentrated on last year in amending was this step seven. Yeah, we just wanted to clarify it to make sure that people understood more clearly what the process was so that, because they were sort of thinking they were going to get to rehash the whole, all the facts of the, and so that's why we went through it to just sort of um, make sure the steps were clear and people understood um, what we would be doing in that process. And for ourselves, just to remember that if if we are, you know, in some things, we need to sort of remind the administration not to share too much with us because if it is a controversial thing and we're going to then need to hear a complaint, we want to make sure that we're um, not having our getting a colored uh, view of things. Mm. So. So while this wasn't in the packet that went out originally, this should be familiar to everyone, mm -hmm. new members, because it's been in your binder. So I, I think we can go ahead and, and uh, move to adopt this, although it wasn't what went out several days ago, um, unless anyone has more edits they want to make or questions or concerns. Yes. I, we, I, so I'm a little late in the conversation. We're talking about the per complaint procedure. Correct. Yes. Yep. I think it's fine as is. Great. Um, so then the next step would be getting rid of all the printed brochures that look like this and making them look more like, well, not format wise, but to read this way. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of the schools have them. So we may want to. Yeah. 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 And then, exactly. and then maybe we want, we want to create a new brochure. I don't know. If in in the past, I don't know who did did these for the district. Do we have a graphic card? Do we have a graphic card? We don't have a graphic visual arts kind of group that would want to do. That? No, it's now yeah. a, now it's oh, digital video, media, yeah. and they do mostly video. So this is not the time. No, it needs to be posted on the website okay. too. Because the old, the one on the website right now is littered with typos. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we need to have that up. Okay. Too. Let's get that down right away. <laughs> what is that, Sam? This is littered with typos. No, not the the, the one, one that's on the current website. Thank you. Which which number? Uh, is that the twenty seven? 
This doesn't list the number, so he won't yes. know. But it's, um, the okay. complaint. it's the complaint procedure. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, we'll get that updated. We, Thank you, yeah, sir. Yeah, I think probably going through all, all of them on the website, there's a, hand, there's a couple with some typos, either a word missing or misspelling or lettered backwards, whatever. But we should just go through all of them and just make sure that they're as clean as can be. Yeah. So do we need a move? Yes, I will entertain a motion to adopt. Okay, well, I hacked the last one, so anything else? <laughs> um, I'll move to, we're just adopting it. We, that's it. Okay, yeah. So I'll just move to adopt the Orange Southwest School District Board Procedure for Hearing Complaints. I second. Okay. Moved by Megan, seconded by Sarah. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? And abstentions. Awesome, passes unanimously. Let's see if we can do that as well with the uh, board rules of procedure. Um, and did such a great job last year in um, getting this to legal counsel and that's actually where it came up about uh, emails coming with public comment and us being able to bring them to the meeting. But we never actually officially adopted them as a whole kitten caboodle. Um, so did anyone see anything that they have questions about, um, concerns about, all these rules of procedure, what they think is missing? And if not, we can have a new date on the bottom if we adopt them rather than 2020. Yes, no? So wait, I'm just... Yep. Why does it say that it was adopted yeah. in 2022. October of 2022? That's what I was actually. wondering too. Just this page, <laughs> you'll notice, has the email communications on it. And that's what we went to legal counsel about October of 22. But the entire thing itself was not adopted. That's what I mean, kit and caboodle. We didn't, oh, as okay. rules of procedure of this board, the entire, we didn't okay. adopt okay. the whole schmabang. Mm. Then I use a technical term like that. Okay, so I'll move to adopt the entire kit and caboodle. Perfect. <laughs> of, of the OSSD board rules of procedure. Those also should go on the, on the website. website. I'll say. I'll second that motion. Seconded by Sam. <laughs> Moved by Megan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Do I have a, a, a concern? I, I just wanted to share that um, in E number one, mm -hmm. you have no flexibility to move your meeting at all according to your own policy. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if it, it there's no flexibility at all. It's like it will be on this day at this time. Mm -hmm. And I just thought you might want to consider providing yourself with some flexibility. But other than that, no other comment. Yeah, to change that, we'd have to change, we'd have to then re adopt. Like, so, change the, the option have to change of this remote. Rules of procedure. If, yeah, we, I mean, decide, if we decide we're not going to meet on the second Wednesday of every month, we're going to meet on the third Thursday or something like that. We that have to go and readopt this too. Exactly. Oh. And that usually would happen. I, we that changed happens after from Mondays to Wednesdays or whatever it was in March. That's, yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's usually yeah. a re reorg meeting. So we can just change it at the reorg meeting. But if we change it at the reorg meeting, we also oh. still have to go back to this rules and of procedure and, 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 and edit this. Remember to edit it. Yeah. And, but mm -hmm. according to right. the VSBA, it seems they, like an extra step. Well, yeah, the VSBA wants you to relook at this and just refamiliarize yourself because you'll have new board members. You'll be so this should be reviewed. Anyway. So this should be reviewed yep. annually anyway. So it's so not final. That would be fine. Right. So we just review it in March when when the reorganization. I'm sure, that gets put on the annual agenda. Yeah. That the yeah, we board rules that. of procedure are added to the annual agenda review in March. Yes, we'll be adopting that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not there. The that person on that committee. So March. So this is good until March. Okay. 
So a motion has been made by Megan to adopt. Sam, do I have second. a sec? Did you second? Mm -hmm. Or was that the last one? That was this one. Oh, yeah. seconded by Sam. Right, because we got to the voting and then there was talking. Um, so again, may I have a show of those in favor? Please. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Fabulous. Okay. Oh, and here we are at the annual agenda. So we've just named something that needs to be added. Um, are there other things people spotted that need to be amended, updated? And if not, I think we can vote to accept it with one more amendment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if there are others, I want to take it personal. The annual agenda? Yes. And that went out as well in very tiny font. Mm -hmm. So the evaluation committee, mm -hmm. when we met the last time, we decided we were going to look at the goals three times a year just to see how the progress is going in the fall and in the winter and then in the spring. So I don't know if we need to add that to the annual agenda. I'm thinking we should, so we don't lose it. To review um, the eval goals. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I would say the first meeting would be, I don't know, what do you guys think? For when the survey goes out, it was false. Mm -hmm. In May. So we're going to review the goals for this year after June, like after the school year, right? So we'll do that in July. Okay. So we will review them and hopefully have them set by September meeting. So I would say maybe November, February, or November, March, and May. They have a schedule set for when they do the Track My Progress and the Star 360, which is where the data would come from. Yeah. I can get the feedback of when that is. Because it, it fits in at specific places in the instruction that they specifically want to look at. Yeah. But I can, I can pull that easy enough and, and get it to you, if that's all right. Get the dates when those are looked at? Yeah, so there's, a, there's a window that they do them. Okay, so then so, those would coincide with our... Yeah, our fall, our spring, our... Okay. And we can add those in. So it actually sounds like maybe we should go through one more round and we'll make a couple more edits to the annual agenda. Okay. And we'll bring it back next month. Sounds great. Awesome. Okay. Really close to 24. Yes, we'll have the annual agenda done at the end of the annual. Uh, okay, so other subcommittee updates, uh, eval committee? Great. Um, so I'm just going to hand out the summary of our survey. Survey. <laughs> yeah, so I'll take this one and I'll pass half this way. And half this way, at the end of the meeting, if you could just hand them back to me, according to the BSDA, that's the best way to um, maintain confidentiality. And then we met a couple times to go over finalizing the goals. Um, the first meeting we had was with Sandra from the VSBA, and basically we came up with the goals that are written in here, so like on page two, you'll see blue, like those are the goals going forward. There was like nine of them. So from that list, I compiled the list and I, we as a group decided that the two goals and the two points of evaluation to focus on for this next year would be um, 
foundational knowledge ends monitoring and improved community relations. And so I took Lane's evaluations he did of um, Patty Sprague, who's a principal at Brookfield. Is that true? Braintree. Braintree. And um, basically applied it to his evaluation um, and tried to make it, instead of being just these ideas of goals, which is what I found the VSBA process left us with, having ones that were more um, concrete, like this is what the test scores are today, this is what they are at the end of the year, this is how much they've improved or how much they haven't improved. Um, and so I asked, you know, is the goal specific, measurable, realistic, results focused, like every goal ever in this world should be, right? <laughs> um, so if you look on page two of this paper, uh, goal number one is improve foundational knowledge for the ends and reading, writing. Uh, page two of what? I'm sorry. Of the, um, this? Oh, have I not handed it out yet? No. I was looking at the first handout. Yeah, that is, you will be very confused about yeah. that. Thank you. Um, so I, you know, I took word for word kind of the evaluation process that Lane went through with his administrator and just said, how can I apply this to, you know, what we're looking for for an evaluation going forward. Um, so I think it's important to note that some of these goals, as long as progress is being made, may take longer than one year. And I wrote that in on the front page and I thought, that was kind of a reasonable mm -hmm. thing to add in because not everything can be fixed in a year, right? Um, so what I would like to look at, and we don't have this information yet. Lane was going to pull it together. We just met like Monday, so it was kind of last minute with everything else going on to get the test scores compared or for 2022-23 to fill them in for the ELA math and science and so then at the end of the year we can look and see what the scores are based from the AOE right yeah you're gonna see them tonight I oh perfect at least then maybe up I here can write them I, in and yeah. then I can have like a solid document um, but then things like social studies life skills and the arts there's not solid test score results so what we're going to use for information is how many students have completed the required national standards and you have that data so the social studies standards yeah it, when they created the standards based report cards the teachers track that as yeah. they go so they'll be able to know if the, the students are on track to actually meet what's required of them to pass those courses or not yeah, yeah. so if, and that's for social studies and then life skills and the arts is there a similar standard uh, the arts, uh, yes, um, they actually have been working on kind of creating an updated version of it. Um, the life skills, um, the standard could be as basic as, you know, because we want all students to have this foundational knowledge, you know, all students before they graduate will successfully complete the life skills course as a, you know, requirement of graduation. Uh, and that's three different semesters or three classes? Three so years. right now without budget intervention, um, it is the on your own course that is in place now. We had talked about um, a while back the idea that it, there really should be three separate semesters at least. One that really is tailored towards the younger students um, at the middle school, one that's tailored for like ninth grade, and then one that's tailored for 11th and 12th because their life skill needs are different in terms of what they're encountering at that, those stages in their lives. And so those would require budgetary action or us, you know, agreeing to shift resources um, to be able to provide the extra staff for those two. But that would be the ideal end goal yeah. is to have those three. And some of that information will come from Lisa and the high school mm -hmm. implementing the um, 
strategic plan that they did with, what's his name? Yeah. Winton. Winton. What's his name? Winston. 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 Winton. Um, so that's where we're at for goal number one. And then, so each of these lists what the outcomes are that we're trying to achieve and what data will be collected. So I don't know if anyone has any questions about that. Um, on the next page. steps that we came up with as a group um, and then for goal number two improved community relations with less division we thought was a big a big one to focus on for this next year um, so that goal is specific trying to develop strategies to promote positive community engagement by a variety of members from the administrative leadership teams um, in our blue in the blue written goals on the summary of the survey delegating tasks is one way for Lane to like kind of spread out how to try to get a more positive relationship with the community throughout the administrators so they're out there promoting that um, another item on the list was identifying our human resources situation and our public relations situation and looking at that and seeing if hiring a human resources person might be beneficial or contracting with um, public relations, a public relations person or firm, I guess every other high school in the state does that, so it might be worthwhile. I think some of that work has already started. And then um, what the positive outcomes were that we decided we wanted to have, and we want positive feedback about school activities and the direction of the curriculum from stakeholders, so that's everybody out in the community. Um, less staff turnover and more student retention and which data would be collected surveys about how healthy um, human resources and public relations are in the OSSD and the action steps um, would be to actually put the survey out whether that would be contracted with an outside entity like a public relations firm or I don't know who else I don't think the VSVA does such a thing. Maybe they do, but we could look into other options they, if the yeah. public relations thing yeah. is really expensive. So having objective and perceptive staff surveys from all of the staff and then also um, objective and subjective school community surveys put out. And we want all of these to be completed by June 1st of 2024. Is that doable? June 1st, 2024. Should be. Yeah. I got the contract for uh, our PR company sitting right in my email. And so then that would give us good information for setting the next evaluate or reviewing this about re reviewing this because it's not actually an evaluation, right? We're looking at it, setting goals now. We're looking at last year, setting goals now. So it will be a real evaluation in July. Sorry, that's confusing. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I just want to acknowledge this is a lot of work. Yeah. For it's this a committee. ton of work. So, it is a ton thank of work. You. Yeah. This together. Yeah. Yeah, she did yeah. she did a really good job. Yeah. Thanks. It's it's a lot of work and I think that anything that is gonna change in this district is a lot of work and it needs people who are willing to do the work and put the time in because it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy that we came up with it and it was good to work with our group and to come up with this. And I feel like it's a good document going forward. So what is the next step? I mean, So the next step 
so I um, emailed the group in Lane specifically asking for the test scores for uh, the found foundational knowledge, which he says he's going to present tonight. Mm -hmm. And then to put those numbers in here, and then we're going to meet, I mean, it's already November, so we'll meet in the, probably in February, and go over this and see where we're at, or when, whenever the foundation, what is that called? It's the foundational knowledge or the? No, the, um, where you get your data from. The assessment. So we've got track my progress track for the lower progress. grades and start 360 right. for the upper. So after you figure out when you get the information from Track My Progress, we'll probably meet in February and then again at the end of the year, like June. Just as the committee or now this starts coming to the full? Well, I was thinking just the committee because uh -huh. it it is like its own thing. <laughs> but if anybody would like to be a part of it, you know, I think we would welcome more people who want to have these regular meetings and track this information. Well, if it does go to the committee, then you would come and report to the to the larger board, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. So, of course. Yeah, but that makes sense that it would Right, first. and so it would gotcha. be on the annual agenda for after we have these meetings and we gather this data so we can report back about where it's at three times a year. So more to add to the annual agenda. <laughs> cool. <laughs> That sounds great. Does anyone have any questions for Chelsea or other members? Of and if you take it home and you want to read it over and you do come up with questions, I think we're happy to answer them, take them back to our meeting, you know, if something's not making sense or looks like it might not be useful information. I would just add we're still going to do what we've been doing. So we're still going to get an ENDS report on each one of our policies because they are basically sort of how we monitor and, and, and make sure that things are in place that we need to have in place in order for the district to run well, but we hold these two goals out um, in particular, but we're still going to have our ends report where we look at, where we look at everything, not just um, foundational knowledge. Um, we're going to look at a full ends report. So that's right, which is out. why there's not um, specific, like improved community relations. You could put the policies under there. Um, treatment of staff. Treatment of staff. Treatment, treatment of parents. Students, whatever. Like right you could parents, put the, right. and then it just becomes so cumbersome. It's like we are already looking at that at the end. In the end policies, so we might as well switch over and talk about it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So it's not to replace, I, I think right. if I can right. yeah, restate what you're saying, it's not to replace anything, it's in addition to. Re yeah, yeah. Re but recognize that on. those goals, like if it's a you know goal on math or uh, the way that we're writing the goals on you know, science and ELA, that would replace potentially the interpretation in the entry court, right? It would be replaced with what the goals are from here. Is, does that make sense? Because isn't that the purpose of the yeah. interpretation, is to say how we've met that standard or how we've met that end? Well, and if you, that we're defining how we're meeting those goals around those areas in this report, it seems like that would be the piece that goes into it. Yeah, well, you're working with us to create the goals, which would be your interpretation for where you're going with these. Yeah, so it's not actually generating too much more work. It's basically making sure Taking that what we agree to here becomes the interpretation and the standard. And right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And we're in dialogue about it. We're not just sort of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a hop in week, so I apologize. Right. So I don't know if everybody wants to... Keep, I mean, it's not a great time to like read through this right now, but if everybody wants to keep these or if you want to just give them back to me, I'm happy to collect them. Or if you want to dive deeper and see what the results of the survey were. I know I did email it to everybody before I knew that I wasn't supposed to, but there's a little bit, the goals are a little bit different because we had met with the VSBA after I had sent that out and come up with more specific sort of goals. Why were you not um, supposed to send that out to the board? Um, I guess because in here it's 
it lists some of the responses um, that were written. This is personnel. It's, it's personnel. Supposed, yeah. yeah, it's like it's a the person. responses that people wrote in the summary of it, and right. it's kind of personal. So it wouldn't be so freedom of information is the concern. Would it be acceptable? Is that the uh, I, I don't think a person from the general public can come and look at somebody's personnel file. No, but that's why we weren't allowed to share it amongst the board because our emails are considered public record. Right, okay. right. And just to keep it private. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because anyway. it really belongs in the personnel file. So whatever anyone wants to do. But that's the report of the evaluation committee. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. this one, we should all be careful to yes. hand back to you. The other we can keep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So let's just do that in order. Mm -hmm. Ah, wait. Here's another one. Thank you. Um, next up, the ends committee. Ms. Ladies. I don't have anything to update with. Great. I mean, I do, but I'm not, I'm not prepared, so. Okay. Next time. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, facilities committee, which is now two members strong. We have a quorum. We'll give you something next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in case uh, everybody didn't see the email, Sarah is now a member of the facilities subcommittee. Do we have to vote? We don't have to vote you on, do we? Um, yeah. We do need to vote. Yeah, that on. should right. So moved. Okay. A second. <laughs> Great. Right. So moved by Katya, seconded by Chelsea. Uh, all Aye. those in favor of Sarah joining the facilities subcommittee? Aye. 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 Visually and audibly, thank you. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Does anyone else want to join the ENDS committee? Oh. If we're adding people to the committee. Is it just you? No, it's me and Hannah and Megan. Show yeah. People will let me join. No, Anne. We don't want your very exclusive. Anne, you want to join that one? Yeah, I made her move. So, move. <laughs> right. Second. Right. so that also, yes, so Sarah has moved that Anne is now a member, mm -hmm. and Sam has seconded yep. your role tonight, clearly. Uh, all those in favor? And joining the ENDS committee. Aye. Audibly and visibly. Right. Please, thank you. Opposed? Extension. Great. Thank you, Anne. Uh, uh, can I just jump on because I don't think we, we touched on this unless I'm losing time here. Um, the letter that we drafted, if people can read that through and send us back some feedback so that we can get that out, I think because we wanted to get that out by December. Right? Yes. So it's in here, second page. This is a very rough draft. It's fine. Did we also? So, oh, we got it in the email. Also. Okay. Okay. It seemed better than very rough. Yeah. Oh. It seemed, it seemed, it seemed good to go. So, if there's any feedback on that letter, just let us know and we can edit it and then present it in December for approval to email to. To be blasted out like the last one, yeah. And that committee is Katya, myself, and Megan, right? So, email any one of us with um, edits. And we'll make sure they'll put in there. Great, thank you. Thank you for bringing us back there. Um, letter edits. Here we go. Let's see. So, Lane, you had suggested that we put this once we're in the facilities um, committee topic mm -hmm. about if we want to really kind of commit to reconstruction being on the table. Right. Yeah, I think if it makes sense um, how serious the board is, um, it, and one of the rationales is it, it'll change the calculus that we use in determining projects, right? If I've got a $300,000 project that, that we need to do that isn't quite a matter of safety at this point in time, you know, if the board says, yeah, you know what, given, you know, budgetary constraints and everything else like that, we're not really that interested in rebuilding, then I would move forward with trying to get that work done with the, the funds that we have. But if the board came and said, hey, you know, we don't know if we'll be able to pull it off, but we're really serious about examining 
you know, rebuilding this building, then I might hold off on a project like that because I wouldn't want to put 300000 into a building that's just going to potentially be torn down, you know, two years in the future, you know, if it could be deferred. So I think part of the discussion, at least for, for me and especially for Bob and, Bob and Wes, who I think are actually listening in, is just so that we can get a better of idea of what we should be working on and things that we might be able to defer or not, if that makes sense. And what's your timeline on that? When which you, which you, piece? Uh, when do you need to know about how serious we are about building versus... Uh, so I would say sooner than better, you got an old building that <laughs> needs lots. Um, I, one of the big things that we had talked about way in the past that I think is not at a safety issue yet, but it is getting there, is our science labs in the high school. And that's a major reconstruction of basically an entire way. Um, I think, so, yeah. Uh, so, um, I think to move forward, I think we owe it to the taxpayers to get a number. Um, so I think we, in order to move forward, we would need to hire someone to draw plans on what we were looking at, right? Yep. So we could kind of get some numbers going on to even see if this is something the community would be yep. interested in doing. So we, and if it's not something they're interested in doing, then we need to look at other options. Exactly. So I think as a board, we should get the ball rolling on hiring someone to... I can have that on your, your plate next next board meeting because we've already been working with somebody to try to outline... Okay, that would be great. ...the study. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and if I... Board with that or am, I just, oh, yeah, I feel like we've talked about it before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we earmarked some funds yeah. to, to begin the process a little bit, but uh, I think to put real numbers to paper, we have to go to another step. It's expensive. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, you're looking probably 150,000 to Which, have that study done. I bet would that be said. coming out of our reserve? Yeah. And potentially just a, a rough ballpark estimate of rebuilding this place. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that too. Mm -hmm. 100 million to 150. Right. It's not a, we it's need not to start somewhere though, and yeah. unfortunately, we, I think, that expense is going to need to happen in order to, people like to see a plan oh, yeah. in place. Yep. And but it sounds like there's at okay. least interest to make sure that we're willing potentially to spend, you know, a fair chunk of money to get that study done so that people have some info. Yeah. Or, or we talked about this. Yeah, why this is why we again? created this committee. Yeah. I mean, I, if, if I may propose that this committee, which is now so robust with two people, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. that so this you guys be another conversation. No. Well, that you guys are, right. have okay. the opportunity to meet with Bob mm -hmm. and Wes and a, a more concrete conversation. Because I think that yeah, in terms of being interested in knowing really what it would take, we're already beyond that. Okay. Right. Yeah, we want to know. Right. That's why we have okay. this committee. Yeah. So um, we'll we will report to that study and back to you too. at a later date, the next meeting. Cool. Um, Bob, are you on board with meeting with Sam and I and Wes? Yes, yes. Hey, Bob. Yes, I, I had to get my microphone back on. I'm sorry, it took me a moment. Would you, uh, would you ask that question again? I want to make sure I understood it. Um, we would like to have a meeting to discuss future plans <laughs> for um, hiring an engineer. Yes, I would, Wes and I both be very much receptive to that participate, participation. Um, we have that money, as Mr. Milliken already said, or we have that number, as Mr. Milliken already said. We are prepared to meet tomorrow on this, but I'm telling you right now that we need to press the trigger. If, we're, if we want the, the study, let's do it. If not, tell us so we can drive forward on other, on other projects, just like Mr. Millington just tried to communicate. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Um, I'm not sure if we can meet tomorrow, but Sam and I will. <laughs> I, under, I, I understand, but I'm just yeah, pushing you because I want an answer. We'll call you, Bob. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs>
Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. And Wes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've and been Wes. on here all this time just to listen for this uh, topic <laughs> to come up. I'm going to I'm gonna break off, and I think Wes will, too. We'll see you guys tomorrow, okay? All right. Sounds Thank good. you. Have a good night. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Awesome. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, just in terms of training, uh, there is a, I'm moving on here, the, there's a budget web webinar coming up about Act 127. Yeah. Um, when we get to the part where we're talking about the conference that Sam and Heather Lane and I attended, um, Sam and I actually attended the budget breakout workshop. Scared, scared you, didn't it? Just to understand, it was just about understanding <laughs> it. But if I could please give the assignment of ev to everyone to register, if you are able to, no, register whether you can attend at noon or not, because once you're registered, you will get the. Um, the, 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 the uh, it's the fourteenth, November fourteenth. The link, thank you, at yeah. noon, I believe, okay. and that's a and Tuesday, I think. Ooh. Next Tuesday. And I'm willing to bet we will still have questions after that and i almost think we should engage chelsea at bsa bsba to help us fully understand the implications because there are some timeline things that make it really complicated when we go to pass the budget we're not going to really know what the tax implications are for taxpayers mm -hmm. so that's going to be a really fun pr campaign for the board to have to do um, to try to get the community on board with whatever budget we put together. So, um, in my experience, just talking to her quickly, she's not only, I appreciated how she explained over and over and over again what Act 127 does and means, but also talked about how we might present the unknown. Um, but so please let's start with just go onto the VSBA website, register Watch for the November the 14th okay. so that um, we can talk about it. Some people will have a better grasp on it than others. And it's a live webinar, so you know, we can ask questions and stuff like that. But please register. Easy breezy. I already did it. Oh wait, it's a live thing we're interacting, so it's not just like we can watch it whenever we want. You will be able to watch it after it happens, but yes, it's a live webinar on the 14th at noon okay. that you register for. They always record them. Yes. yes. Well, so I could watch it after if I miss correct. it. Correct. Okay. Yeah. But that's why you definitely want to register. So right. I think it right it'll only give you the available recording if you have register. Is that correct? Got it. Well, you'll get it. I mean, they'll put it in their webinar archives eventually, yeah. oh, but okay. to get it kind of right after the webinar. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, okay, we're moving on to EL reports 2.1 and 2.2. This is a second read. Let's start with 2.1 treatment of students, parents, guardians, and community. Lane, you want to talk more about it then? Yeah, it, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if there's questions, I'm happy to. It may take me a minute to orient myself to the provision. But. Yeah, I'm bopping around here. Yep, it's on the back of this. No, it's a Does anyone have points of discussion? So, 2-2, two, two, mm -hmm. I'm going to highly recommend to the board that this is held in deference um, given the discussion and this that was brought up tonight. Mm -hmm. And as my right as an employee within the district, I am going to ask the board to get an independent person to come in and investigate every statement that was made in here because there were other people at the meeting. I am going to ask the board to also investigate the videos and also investigate the reports that were written that describe, you know, what was seen in the videos for veracity. I am in a position of public trust. That trust has been challenged, which folks have a right to do. And so the public also has a right to know if that challenge was faithful or not. Can I ask what you're holding up on? 
This was the document that uh, either Haley and or Mike had put together. I did not. Haley <laughs> so, <clears throat> That's my make sure that you get. Okay. And, I, and I will put the request in writing. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, who, so then I Chelsea, have a question, mm -hmm. question about that. Who would we get to look at that, an outside person? Um, you'd need somebody trained. My recommendation, and again, I, I don't want to ha have there be a conflict of interest, so I'm going to give you very limited info. I would reach out to PH or take his advice. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And in fact, if I could get a motion to... Um, to uh, um, connect with Pietro. Thank you. Yes, for Chelsea and I to connect with Pietro. Regarding. So moved. Oh, oh, okay. Can I just have a... Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can yes. I just have a summary again of what we're asking, we're looking to investigate, just so the question so is clear? The allegations that sound like in this yeah, there, there, there's a lot in there that I think needs to be investigated. So just the document? Uh, no, um, the document, the videos, as well as the reports that went along with the videos. So anything basically pertaining to this and the process of the incident? So, yeah. We're investigating these things, or we're having someone investigate these things. And what is the question? Whether you are in compliance with the with the policy? I again. So the logic here being, I'm in a position of public trust. Yep. That public trust was just challenged. The public has a right to know whether I did violate public trust or whether I did not. What and is so the standard that, for public trust, though? What's that? What's the standard for public trust? I guess, like, I, I just... I did not, I did not, op I'm being told that I did not operate probably within probably half a dozen of the board's policies based upon what's written here, including EL 2.2, which we're considering right now. So what Lane is suggesting is that we do not, we, we defer voting to accept mm -hmm. EL 2.2 this evening? Mm -hmm. Um, until we have a chance to... Uh, EL 2.2 is retrospective, correct? Mm -hmm. Like we're looking we're looking oh. back at the last yep. school year, yep. correct? So his interpretation Point. would not be invalid With this based on year. this new information. Okay. So exactly. I don't know that we do need to defer voting makes on sense. what is retrospective. Mm -hmm. but, Logic makes but sense. But this incident would be included in, in the following year's interpretation, right? That is true. And we can choose to monitor any policy at, at any, any time. At any time. So given the circumstances. Um, yeah, and we can also choose not to monitor this one right now. Right. Except that we have a schedule that says we will do it on this day. <laughs> so. Well, we, we did do the first read when we said we would. So right. if we want to defer... Yeah, we could accepting it, it or we accept it because it is retrospective. Retrospective, and then if we want to re-monitor this policy, right? Ask mm -hmm. for another. Um, uh, uh, I would think that we would accept it for the past, and then we would wait until the study is done, and then re-request to have it on the agenda again to look at it again. I agree. Does that seem like a process that would be reasonable? Just to keep the policy as on schedule. Yeah. Well, and when we review them, we don't have to accept them, so. True. Mm -hmm. Or he might be out of compliance. Which is also saying we don't accept them. He's, he's presenting them to us right. to say, I'm in compliance because of these things. And if we say, well, we disagree that you're in compliance, then that's also just yeah. not accepting. We have these evidence yeah. to the contrary. Right. Right. Okay. So what do we want to do as a board for policy 2.2? .2? Is well, the question? If do we accept his interpretation? As written? Right. So if I actually, in this instance, I would like to separate them. Um, and ask if there's a motion to accept 2.1. Wait, we also, mm -hmm. Kasha made a motion for you to connect with Pietro. Yes, she I did. seconded, and we didn't and then we, and then we And then we changed okay, the we, subject. So thank we you. need to go back to that first. Hole. Thank you. So there's a motion on the table uh, to, um, connect to connect with Pietro. Allow Chelsea and I to connect with Pietro about this, the about an independent investigation. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Great. Okay. Chelsea will connect and 
Great. Okay, so now you need a motion to accept policy 2.1. 2.1. Yes. So I'll move. That's treatment of students, parents, guardians, and community. I second. Moved by Megan, seconded by Sarah. All those in favor? Okay. Audibly and visibly? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions. Great. Passes unanimously. I will entertain a motion to accept 2.2 if there is one. Help me. I don't know. I mean, or well, we, we could also entertain a motion, motion to, to not, defer, yeah, or, or you know, to kick or. the can down the road or not approve. Or you can change your motion to approve, and then you have the na the nays declining it, right? Or right. So still, so still, okay. But I'm not all hearing those, a motion. All those in favor say aye. All those in opposed say yeah. Right. So if someone wants to move to accept it, that this would be the moment. So the question, and the question is, do we agree with his interpretation? Is it a reasonable in interpretation? Is there a rationale? And is there evidence? Are we comfortable with the evidence showing uh, Remember, this is a look back. Yeah. And this is a look back, yeah. Um, <coughs> why would we not accept it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think given the current situation. But the current question, situation is not addressing this. Right, this, 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 this interpretation. Because it's a look back from. So the reasons period. that we wouldn't accept it is if anyone feels that Lane has not either interpreted reasonably or provided enough evidence. Yes, During it's still retrospective, period, yeah. but these would be the reasons that mm -hmm. one may not, would vote not to accept it or vote against accepting it. Where is it specified that this is a look back? D it doesn't say it directly on this, so I'm just wondering, like, how would someone know that we're we're approving something that is a look back if they needed to look at this or there's, wanted to know? There's a definition of executive limitations somewhere in the policy pieces, I believe. Mm -hmm. So you're always you're always looking at the past year. Okay. Yeah, you know? and so I, um, Rachel's argument was a was a good one and logical. So right, and it's dated the 11th. And the new information that you were presented with is dated the 23rd. I think with the confusion, um, so I make a movement to... The 11th, the yeah, the 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm with you. But <laughs> same difference. Yes. So, so uh, I think here. with the confusion, um, we should re-look at how it is we are reading the policy for current and the past year. So with the confusion of that, I move to table policy 2.2 and it will be on next month's meeting to review and read. Okay. Anyone second that? I second. More discussion? Yep, I think Rachel's got some discussing in her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really. I just I just feel like it's it's been presented and we either we either and we, it's been read this is this is the second, second. Yeah. reading. So either we yeah. agree with what he's presented or we don't. Um, and I I I will probably vote against your motion, which is fine. Because um, I feel like we kind of have to make a decision on what's in front of us. Because it was this was presented originally in the October meeting. Correct. And there were no changes made since that date. So no new information pertaining to the date before it was originally presented to us. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Am I making sense? 
Right also, I was not present at the October that meeting. So that isn't know. what you're going to do. But it was just the first reading. Okay. So we didn't vote on anything. Okay. Okay. So as long as you got those materials, so you had a first reading. Basically got from okay. when the last time we accepted it to October 10th, to October 5th when it's dated for a first read is when we're thinking, did we receive the information in this report? Is there a way we can put, when we look at these, like the dates on the actual paper so we can say, okay, like, so if situations like this come up, we're not like, but what if something wishy -washy? But, but what if something came up on October 1st yeah. and it didn't come to the board's attention? So you wrote this on October 5th and it doesn't come to the board's attention until December 5th. And, we're like, and he's like, actually, you know what? You've already accepted my interpretation for that date, so now you can't even consider whatever came before October 5th. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, and remember that you're, we're accepting his interpretation of the policy. So are we feeling like what he's saying? When, when our policy says that with respect to the treatment of paid and volunteer staff, the superintendent shall not operate without written personnel rules that clarify rules for staff, provide for effective handling of grievances, and protect against wrongful conditions. So he's saying, his interpretation is, all district employees will be provided with clear job responsibilities, proce procedures for registering for complaints, as well as access to district's human resources protocols. Um, the, uh, the district will develop procedures and protocols to address unique situations when they occur so that occurrences are managed in a consistent and fair manner. So that's how he's interpreting this policy. He gives us a rationale and then he says, here's your evidence. I have an up-to-date teacher contract. Um, he's got the master agreements, which remember those all handle, that's all through the union, it's all negotiated. There's a process for that. Um, and so this is, and the OSUD board's conflict resolution complaint policy. So, that's what he's using for evidence, uh, as well as uh, does he say anything else? Really, he didn't clear. So that's what he's giving us for the evidence to say that he's in compliance with this interpretation. So we have to decide: Are we? Do we agree that with his interpretation? Is it reasonable? And is the evidence supporting that interpretation? And if we, if we don't agree with this interpretation, then we have to change our policy to be more specific. Right. That's where we've struggled with, and that's why I keep on saying we need, we need. That's why we do this. That's, yeah, that's and we need to it. sort of push for the information that we're getting so that we understand and feel comfortable with the interpretation that he's that he's giving giving us or we're changing our policies and that's why we have the first read then yeah. giving us another month um, or at that first read because we've had it since Kyle sent it out before then to say mm, not enough for me this is what I want to see for the second read in order to accept it So, regardless of dates, I mean, that's why I think you're right, we can't put dates, but this all has to do with before the first read, and that first read was our opportunity to say, we need more, or we need different. Mm -hmm. We have to vote on the motion. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the motion is to push it off for a month. To, yes. So we can vote that down, or we can... I think right. it's clear that we're looking at the past and we need to go forward from that date. But there is a motion and a seconded. So all those in favor of 
uh, uh, tabling them. Tabling. tabling till next meeting, 2.2. Uh, all those in favor? Audibly, visibly? Aye. Oppo Aye. Thank you. Opposed? Aye. 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 A motion. <laughs> or nay, Aye. right. Um, so the motion does not pass. I think just because we say that we accept, it, you know, if we do accept it, just because we say we accept it for the period that he interpreted for doesn't mean that he he can't be out of compliance with it now. Now, we could ask him tomorrow to monitor again. to monitor again. Mm -hmm. So we could actually ask next month that we revisit and have this this resubmitted based on the time frame from the start of the school. Year. I think with an with an investigation ongoing, I would. I mean, I'm not saying yeah, we would yeah. do that, but yeah, I'm just yeah. saying we yes. have that. We exactly. don't have to wait a whole year. We could always, we could at any time ask for mm -hmm. an, an EL report out of the time frame that it would normally come up if there's concern or if there's something that we want to look at. In addition to those that are on the annual agenda that we yes. commit mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. monitoring. Okay. So then now, so I, just, I will, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that we don't have any evidence of not good treatment of staff prior to that period. There's no formal complaints, there's no any of that. So, you know, to be fair to the process and to what we're looking at, like even if we've heard scuttle about treatment of staff, because there's no solid evidence or information about it and we just have to we have to sort of do we decide. know that's for sure that there well are no I think we no, need to rein ourselves in here because um, what we are voting to accept is Lane's interpretation Lane's evidence of that interpretation is that interpretation reasonable has he prevented prevented presented evidence of that interpretation is he in compliance we are not here to vote on whether we think he um, right treats the staff nicely yes. but Thanks it's not I think back we down. just need to rein in what what we're doing with this mm -hmm. so um, Chelsea if what I'm hearing from you is that you may be prepared to make a motion right now to accept this EL 2.2 and, and that doesn't mean that we can't do the independent investigation, and it doesn't mean that we can ask for a different interpretation because we have different kinds of evidence. But I, I just think this is very tricky. It's very hard. And, that, and this has been kind of an emotionally charged meeting, or at least public comment was. Um, and I think it's important, at least for myself, this is this is dry what we're talking about right now accepting this interpretation mm -hmm. this is not emotional this is was he reasonable did he provide evidence to that do we accept it and if someone doesn't that's okay okay but that's I, yeah mm -hmm. I won't say it three more times I think I said it. yes <laughs> thanks for uh, <clears throat> bringing it back down So, do I have a motion of any type right now pertaining to Paul to EL two point two? Just looking. I I move we accept policy two point two as written with the as written. Okay, moved by Rachel. Do I have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Anne supposed to offer more discussion. Is there more discussion? Okay. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion on the table to accept EL 2.2 as written, please visually and audibly say aye and raise your hand, please. Aye. 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 Thank you. Those opposed? Abstentions? 
I did not see some hands there, so but I did see one, two, three, four, five. So the motion does pass, and I have another one. Thank you. I the motion does. Pass. Okay, we have a first read now of policy C9, Wellness and Comprehensive Health. Um, this is Heather, you're up. Yeah, great. Hi, everybody. I attended a session at the School Board Association conference that we attended that really helped to guide this. This is a required policy that will replace our existing C9. Um, the most significant change is the inclusion of um, the goals for comprehensive health education which is required by the state, but not required by the federal government. And this is a required policy by the federal government, all sections except for comprehensive health education. Um, and so it's very similar to our existing C9. The changes that are included um, are really mostly about the health education, but also a little bit more strictness around healthy snack rules and regulations. There is still room in here to have celebratory food, as long as it's not charged for. Um, but it, the language sort of says we'll do our best to align it with healthy choices. Other than that, it's very similar to the existing C9. That's it. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Uh, Respond to a sign statement. Taking all the fun out of life. <laughs> no more cupcakes. It doesn't actually say that. I adopted the, I, I they had choices and I chose the most lenient language. Um, and so that's, if you guys want to look at the one about that, it's at the end of nutrition guidelines, um, Roman numeral four. It, we had two choices of language, and one was that we will prohibit any foods that do not align with the snack rules, and or this one, which I selected, which is, to the best of our ability, we will do our best um, that celebratory foods are in line. So there's still a little room in there for a cupcake. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to make it so cake. Yeah, cake. Mm -hmm. Preferably whole grain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Heather? This is a first read, so. Yep. Yep. Okay. We're at budget parameters presentation. Ready? You, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'll try. I'll, I'll try to keep. Hopefully, I can keep my brain functioning because some of the stuff's a little complex. Mm. Um, kind of the objectives of the discussion that we're about to have is it's mostly about understanding the current financial landscape um, that we're dealing with and a lot of that has to do with the Act 173 which was the results of the weighting study right you know the state recognizing that certain categories of student um, actually require a little bit more funding to be able to get an equitable education compared to the general population um, the other thing that we want to touch on a little bit is the budget impact of our contractual and mandatory obligations. There's some weird caps that have come in under the new financial laws that I'll touch on. Um, and one of the problems that we may be encountering is that just the increase in the budget that we have to do to meet what's mandatory kind of puts us over one of them. And so we want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so there may not be a whole heck of a lot above and beyond just, you know, paying the increases for contracts and health insurance and, and, and whatnot um, to be able to do. So a couple of parts and pieces. Uh, the data is still flowing in from the AOE, and I think kind of Sam touched on it a little bit. We've got some formulas and things that we need to do to be able to calculate people's tax rates and you know, be able to estimate what the potential impact is going to be on, on homeowners. Um, and we may not have those formulas, I believe they said, until July. Um, yet we have to somehow plan a budget without that critical information to communicate to voters. Um, and so that's one of the biggest pieces out there. The data we get comes in sporadically. They're supposed to have it all in our hands by, by early to mid-December. Mid um, under the law, they, they typically do not. 
Um, so we might be scrambling around again just before the December board meeting when we talk about budget again um, and still not have everything we need to make things make sense. So Act 27, we talked a little bit about this. It adds waiting for certain categories of students. You know, some examples of that are small schools, um, English language learners, and low income. And it's recognizing the fact that certain students, again, may require a little bit more funding to get the same and equal ed educational opportunities that, 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 that other students get within the district. And so they're trying to find a way to, to manage that. The other piece that's on the, the horizon here, which is going to be coming to a close actually in September um, coming up, is that we have benefited greatly from the COVID area era grant funding um, that has been coming in known as ESSER, right? Elementary Second, uh, Secondary Schools Relief Fund. Um, we benefited with the work that we did uh, to a tune of somewhere over $7 million. Right now we have about 1.5 to 1.8 million dollars of staff that are being funded by those grants that will dry up and we have no real way of absorbing them into the regular budget um, unless it's through attrition. We have people move on, we have somebody who's in a grant position that is well suited for um, that position and wants it and can move into it. Um, and so, you know, we have this issue that, that we're dealing with that there may be quite a few rifts. And that would be keeping the staff member employed, but it wouldn't be keeping the position that they are filling. Yes. Under, yeah. And we had a lot of switches like that last year. You know, the union came in kind of questioning, even though they, they saw, I, I showed them all the staff that had left and the rationale why, and let them pick and, and prod with it last year. Um, they were pointing out, well, you know, this staff member, you know, should be on the list. It's like, no, they shouldn't because they didn't leave the district. They're in a grant-funded position, so they chose to move into a regular position that was open so that they would have a permanent job. Um, and so there were a lot of switches like that that happened last year. I think there were like 8 to 10, you know. We, we, yeah, we, we're working we took on a look it. At it. We still have a few, few to do. Yeah. So Act uh, 127, right, what it does is it adjusts the funding formulas and recognition, like we said, that certain categories require a little bit more to be able to get the same education as everyone else. And what it does um, is it adjusts the number of students we receive funding for. So last year, right, the state said, oh, you got 858 bodies there. So we are going to give you the equivalent of the property yield for each of those students, which was about $15,000 per student. What they're doing with the weighting system is even though we only have 858 students, because some students cost more than uh, an individual student, they actually, what they do is they just add it up and say, oh, all the, this additional weighting says is that what we really need to do is provide you with funding for, in our case, about 1,123 students. And that sounds really good, right? Because we have this increase in the number of student bodies. We get paid by students um, in the yield. So if this goes up, it would make sense that, yeah, how much we're getting from the state would go up too. And that's not what happens. Um, and I'll give you kind of an example. There's, it should hopefully be easy to understand if it's not yell at me. Uh, like I said, I'm a little, little tired. Um, so we're going to pretend here that 87.5 million has been set aside from the education fund to fund education around the state. Mm -hmm. And we're going to pretend that there are only four districts in the state. We've got us, we've got White River Valley, we've got Central, which is Northfield, um, Williamstown, and we've got CVU. And so they go through their, their waiting study. And for, let's stop, let's stop. This is their numbers from last year in terms of students. And so what the state would do is add up all those students right, 5,658 would divide it into here, and they would say, oh, that means we're going to get $15,479 for each student. And if I want to know how much I'm getting, I take this much, I multiply it by my, my 858, and I get $13 million um, from the Ed Fund. Make a little bit of sense? I'm talking fast, and I know I'm... <laughs> right. So what's happening under the new system is the weights. So we've got a lot of poverty students mm -hmm. here, and they count more in terms of weighting than just a, a regular general student um, within the student population. So they're going to give us credit for 1123, right? Uh, White River Valley, they're going to give 3200. Central, they're going to give 1400. CVU, they're going to give 2500. And these numbers are made up a little bit to make the point. If you add them up, you get now 8,223 students 
I divide it into the same amount of money because the money in the Ed Fund that they're giving people is still the same. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we're now only receiving $10,651 per student. You multiply that by our 1123, and now we're getting 11 million instead of the 13 million. And so what happens for a lot of schools is as the number of students goes up, in a lot of cases, the yield goes down, the amount of money you get per student goes down. And so the impact on our district, and this is a part of talking about the financial landscape, the impact on our district, as far as we can tell, because we don't have all the hard numbers yet, is at best we're going to break even. Most likely we're going to lose a small amount, hopefully less than a million bucks. But what we lose through this exchange, if we want to continue to have the same services that we currently have, we're going to have to make, up, make it up through local funding. Questions on this? Again, simplified model of what really goes on to try to make the point. Um, but people all got really excited. We all got really excited last year. Yeah, you know, we're going to have 1,200 students that they're going to be paying us for. So we're going to get this huge jump in. No. Yeah. Didn't yeah. happen to most schools. Did the legislators kind of go, oh, shoot, this didn't work this the way we thought it would be? <laughs> I, or are they like, I am going oh, to okay. give my opinion, which is not based on anything other than a quick communication with the legislatures last year as they were making decisions about stuff. Going to the block grants for SPED cut money, doing this, cut money. So it's, it's backfiring against what they were hoping to do. Well, unless what they were hoping to do was to reduce Ed tax spending payoff. spending overall. Yeah. yeah. So important understandings to walk away from um, based on what I can tell right my limited capacity and kind of studying this stuff a little bit is having the weights work in our favor by giving us more students doesn't necessarily mean we'll receive a bigger piece of the education fund we do expect our funding to go down moderately um, because of this if we want to keep services the same we're going to have to make it up at the local level the other thing that is impacting us is this is the total of enrollment in the OSSD. We typically jump up and down, but typically the overall trend is up over time. Um, but for next year, we are down. Um, we had the event of three months of folks from outside of the community um, piling on death threats um, to our students and our staff. Um, and a lot of the folks that, that left in, when I was connecting with the guidance counselors about it um, a little bit last year uh, when school choice came up was about the fact they didn't feel safe. And so we have had a decrease in um, the total student body. It may recover, right? It's been kind of a quiet year this year so far. Hopefully that, that happens and we get back up. But this is right lowering that basic number that they apply the weightings to. So Lane, can you break that down by school, like where we lost the most students? Was it students in the high school? Um, I'm, I'm going to talk off the cuff. Um, a lot of the students were at the high school. I think we lost 15 last year, or coming into this year. Mm -hmm. Most of them were through school choice, and most of them were, were our LGBTQ students leaving, um, from, from what I remember. Our elementary schools over the course of time have tended to increase um, outside of the, the events of last year and what we're seeing now. Typically at the high school, they are either steady or mm -hmm. an increase, and they kind of switch from year to year um, is the typical trend. I can't see the numbers. What are the... What are the um... So we were at uh, 858 last year. We are down... Two years ago, what were we? That, re that really high point that's, that's pulling the line up. Oh, uh, like 9.05. We had two of those, right? Like I said, we tend to, because we have bubbles in populations and stuff. So a lot of our data looks that way. It jumps up and down. But the overall trend, like I said, is still going up. You know, on, on average, even with the two down years, if you, if you look at our overall trend, we're still on average, um, over the course of time, adding about five students a year to the district. That's what the, the, the slope is telling us. So the question is, is does this con ten, right. continue? Right. We keep going like we are. We're, that line's not going to go up anymore. Yeah. And, and it does have an impact on, on funding, right? Because we get paid by kids. 
So, let's see if I can explain this one. Um, right, there is a new 5% tax rate cap. So, if next year's school tax rate increases by more than 5%, it's capped at 5%. But well, what does that mean? That means that the tax rate, school side tax rate, not the CLA portion of the tax rate, but the school side tax rate last year was a dollar thirty-nine per hundred dollars of assessed value. Right. So if you've got a three hundred and eighty-five thousand dollar home, you can use this to figure out, you know, how much your taxes would be. The most it could go up, because there's a cap on it, it could go up to a dollar forty-six. We can actually spend more money that should drive it up higher than that, and the state will give us the money, but they are going to fix our tax rate at 1.46. Does that make a little bit of sense? They're trying to be kind because they realize the waiting study is going to have a dramatic effect on what people's uh, dollars are coming and going. So they're capping it and saying, yeah, if, if, if you ask for a million dollars, you know, your tax rate would go up 8%, but we're going to cap it at 5 We're going to give you the 8% money, but what your taxpayers see will not go above 5%. So that's a good thing. Maybe. And that's when we get into the complexities that they put into, into our budgets. They also did this. They said as long as, long as, so this is true, as long as the per pupil spending doesn't increase by more than 10%. So we can have our per pupil spending go up by $2,100 uh, before we hit that limit. If that happens, this bet is off. Is that based on how much we spent per pupil this year? How much do we spend per pupil this year? Uh, I can go up. It's, it was about 22000 Actually, so. I take that back. It was 22000 I believe, was the threshold. I can pull all these numbers for you if you ask me. It was closer to like 21, 21 one. Okay. Yeah. Now, so if you go over the 10%, you lose the 5 Are you? Right. You you're five, you're yeah. stuck for anything you over five. five. You're stuck. You're stuck for everything anything over five. If you go over the ten, you can still petition to go in front of the review board, which they haven't created yet, and they don't know how it's going to be implemented yet. The Spanish Inquisition. Right. So why did you do this? You didn't do this. You get no benefit, and you can never benefit from the five percent tax for this five percent tax yeah. cap for the five years in the future that it exists. But yeah. there's something about if you don't get the 5% cap, it goes away. Or if you do get the 5% cap, it goes away. So what was that part? It's, uh, that's what you say. It said if you, if you go over the 10%, you can never get the 5% for the okay. next five yeah. years. So, that's what it was. so let's take a look at what you're talking about. So what a lot of people are talking about is, okay, how can we game the system, right? Because if my tax rate's only going to go 5%, but I can actually increase, you know, potentially on the student side of things up to 9.99% and not violating anything, maybe I'm getting free money here. Well, as far as I can tell the way that the law works is they put this 5% cap in for five years, um, but if you play the game, you're going to lose because you're going to have a cliff year in the, in the fifth or the sixth year. So... This is our budget, right? We're about a $24 million budget. I don't go over the 5% cap. I'm right at the 5% cap every year, right? So next year, this is uh, how much you know, we'd have to spend. This year is how much we'd be spending. This is our budget. So this is our budget after five years, right? It's 30 million, you know, 630,000. Let's say I want to play the game and say, well, you know what? I'm going to spend 8% because there's 3% there that they're giving me for free. And they're going to give me that money. And so this is what's going to happen with my spending in the district over the course of the five years. At the end of the five years, I'm five million ahead of where I would have been. But the problem happens in the next year in that when we move into the next year, the state is only going to give you credit for this. We've been spending this. That's what we're operating our district on now. And if going into the next year I want to maintain our level of funding, I'm going to have to bring over that $4.6 million to get us up to what we've, been spending. what we've been spending. And that's the cliff. And so I'm 99% sure, based upon what I've read, that this is the occurrence. So why I'm bringing this up 
is as we go through this budget discussion, our best bet, as far as I can tell, 5% or less. Now we're going to see a real problem. Where do we stand just in, what, in terms of what I call contractual and kind of mandated increases, right? So these are things that are contractually mandated. They have to happen. We have an 8% salary increase that was agreed to with the teaching staff and the union, right? That has to happen. And, right, eight, 85 to 90% of our overall budget is staff salaries. So that's a huge number. We did a 9.4% increase um, for the support staff, right? They're a smaller group, has an impact, not nowhere near as big as the teaching salary. Well, we also had a 16.7% increase to health insurance mm -hmm. that's coming into place next year. I'll go to the yellow ones in a minute. We also, this is mandated, based upon the students, we're having, a, we seem to be a magnet for special education students, probably because we actually serve them pretty well. We have students moving in all over the place. They said they had seven when I was talking with RES today, the, the staff at RES, that uh, moved into first grade alone that were super high needs. So we have to be able to provide the services that, that they need, so we're looking at a 3.25% increase there. Doesn't sound like a lot, but in terms of dollars it is, because they have a $5 million budget. Um, these are two things that I'm going to throw up here and say, from my perspective, they're mandatory but they could be cut if they had to be. I do not recommend it. The first one is this, 6% um, increase to the facility su supply line, right? To keep things clean, to keep the buildings running the way they need to, and two additional custodians. We've talked to some of the board members as we bumped into each other of the need for keeping the schools, the bathrooms, and things clean, and we need extra staff to do that. So based upon that discussion, I'm gonna say that that's mandatory. And then this is a huge one. Um, we went out, we were one of the few districts in the state that built a full day free preschool for all four-year-olds, and we still maintain our 10 hours a week for three-year-olds. Um, Two-thirds of that program is currently in the regular budget. One-third of that program is still being funded by grants. If we want to preserve, if we want to preserve that preschool program, we're going to have to pay for it out of the regular budget. So we need four personnel. Um, again, I think it's, a, it's one teacher, it's three pairs, it's about 247000 So questions on these parts and pieces? Everybody's looking either tired or depressed. It's hard to tell. It's pretty discouraging. Yes. Um, total required increase for mandates and priorities. Well, this is where we are this year. This is where we need to be next year, just on the pieces we discussed without any of the other millions of dollars of asks that have been coming up from, from the staff to help them meet the ends um, as they're working on their goals. Difference of $1.5 million, right, right off the bat, we're at a 6.65% increase, just in mandatory spending. So we're over the 5% cap. Yes. Yep. So we got to do what we got to do. But this is the, the, the piece that the board, I think, either needs to have a discussion or, or just to mull over between now and when we meet on this in December, um, is where do you want to go with this? Can I find some tricky ways to try to eliminate that cliff? I probably can, but we're still going to have to pay that money. I can probably spread over paying it up over time. Um, but I do worry about that cliff, and I'm going to try to get... Uh, Brad James to give me any answer on whether what I showed you is correct based upon the law. I believe it is. I believe it was mentioned in, in one of our conferences. Is that clear? Um, but my recommendation is, you know, don't go over 5%. And, and if we have to, don't go over any more than we have to. Thoughts, questions, tears? <laughs> I'm wondering one way to still keep everyone happy is me, like you said, we needed two custodians. What if we we could live with could what we we've got one rather than two, we and could. would that bring us down to the five? 
My, that 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 based on their salary, and I'm just taking a rough estimate. We probably go from six point six five to like six point two five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. For yeah. The ba the biggest piece, the biggest piece of that, is the eight percent increase for for staff salaries. Mm -hmm. Again, not complaining. Well deserved. Uh -huh. It just it hit. It's it's hitting in an unexpected budget year. Um, and then the second biggest piece of, of the overall budget is going to be probably that health care increase. That's huge. That's another thing I, um, I'm wondering is, is that if every person takes the health care plan? Because I know some people take their spouses or, you know, decline the health care plan. The, these numbers... Plan. <laughs> yeah, but these these numbers took into account exactly what people are taking this year. Okay. Robin did the did the math on that. Okay. So it could change a little bit, mm -hmm. um, right? Somebody could have a baby, and now you're on the family plan. But she used the calculations based upon you know who's on a family plan, who's on a two person, who's on a single. Um, so that is factored into, into okay. these numbers. So good question. So not a lot of wiggle room, is what you're saying. No, well, it could be up to ten percent. Just. Do you feel lucky in five years? <laughs> I guess is the question. And we expect the preschool program to maintain its size. Uh, maintain its size. It's serving about 60 kids a year, yeah. um, which is about the size of a typical class. Um, I'm gonna, if there's time tonight, if not, I can show I can show you some data that, that will show that it's had an impact. Because our first group of preschoolers that started in that program, and they started in the middle of COVID, um, are now in like grades three and four. And if you look at the scores for grades three and four, compared to what the old three and four grades were um, in previous years, they're up quite a bit. So it's having an impact, which is the intent. We had a, we had a, a uh, issue here where there was a lot of foundational knowledge the kids weren't getting from year to year and they were moving on. And so you, I call them the pipeline kids. You know, you're in sixth grade, you missed a chunk here, you missed a chunk here, you missed a chunk here. You've missed so many chunks at this point in time, I can't fill in all the holes now, and you're going to have difficult learning what you need to learn in this grade. The purpose of the preschool was to make sure that all the kids were starting off with a really strong foundation, and we did the curriculum work so that when they're hitting each of the grades along the way, they're not having holes. Right? So what you should see happening is we're still trying to fill in the holes for these kids here. That's what the after school programming and that's what the summer programming is about. But you should see a stronger group of kids coming up from the lower grades and slowly year after year moving their way up into 12th grade um, was kind of a plan. So any other questions on budget? I did try to abbreviate these as much as I could. Next time you get to see everything everybody's asking for. And legitimately how the process works is we have our broad goals which are your ends and, and which are the goals that we're kind of developing here the principals develop their goals to support them they work with the staff to support the goals to support them and then the communication comes back up they say hey in order to be able to do this this is what we need if we're going to meet these goals that we're setting these are the resources we need. And so that's what you're going to see next time, is you're going to see all the asks that folks are saying they need to meet those goals. So. Hmm. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All I have to say about that. That's <laughs> right. great news. Budget, okay. yeah. <laughs> it's big at the end, so. Uh, I mean... There's one variable to think about is if at all healthcare does get reformed and changed. So because the fact that you get a sixteen to seventeen percent, sixteen point seven percent increase this year, is there is question around the state as to why that was so high for for teachers. Whereas the Blue Cross Blue Shield, pretty standard but good plan that went up by 7% this year. So there is like questions around why did, why was that so high? Of course they lobbied really hard for a pretty awesome plan. Does the Green Mountain Care Board not control that cost also, that insurance increase also? 
You know how that works? I don't really know. I don't either. I don't know how that works. But yeah, that, so just question. when thinking about this five-year cliff and the rate of inflation, it, is there opportunity for that to calm down and for us to get some more, a little bit more control? My biggest fear is if we start cutting um, in already a tumultuous education time, are we going to are we are we really meeting the needs of the students? So, and I'm actually quite surprised that our spending per pupil will go down from uh, the the fund. yield. Yeah. yeah, I I had full. Um, expectation that it would go up. Um, I knew that because of the change from reimb reimbursement fund, uh, grant funding for special education last year, which is also annoying, the fact that they implemented 127 a year after 173 is also another challenge for a district like ours, which is heavy on special education needs, and we got a, inherently a deep, a, the census block grant is every district got the same amount. So we're, we're funding that through taxpayer dollars. Yeah, we lost, we lost, it was 250 to 280,000 with that change going to the block grant that right. year that we had to make up on the regular budget. Yeah. Wait a minute, so they, they gave everybody the same amount of money? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you telling us how to how to ask questions? Yes, because nobody's ever asked a question during the answer <laughs> that I remember. Oh yes, we have. And the well, good. I'm I'm gonna hold you to it. The thinking around that and was there was speculation that some districts were cooking their special education needs in order to receive more state funding through the reimbursement process. Uh, why aren't they looking at just demographics and testing? I mean, because I the 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 real again, I'm I'm jaded in it and watching and hearing the discussions. The real goal was to cut. They had the, they they started off with a report. They started off with a report that led into this act, and it basically said, "Oh, you all have too many paras. You have too many support staff." So when the basis that you're starting from is a belief that you have too many staff trying to serve special ed, then the logical outcome is if you put something into legislation, the result is to try to force you to cut those things they think you have too much of. So there is a logic and behind the, it. And the study did not draw a correlation between poverty and special, special education. Special. Yeah, it, the, although I think that study was probably soft and not uh, done thoroughly enough, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what happened to the state's focus on equity? So they packaged the deal <laughs> as an equity piece. So inherently, CVU and Stowe are going to lose money per pupil um, more significantly than we are. Um, but what we're not, what we didn't see is a, a community like ours we thought would have gone up more, and it's actually kind of state level, and, and, and if not, go down. So who is getting more money? Who is benefiting? Concord? Uh, White River Valley, maybe? There, there are some schools that did. They showed a couple North of actual examples. But they examples, almost balance out. So yeah. if somebody goes down, somebody else has to go up. Essex yeah. County, Caledonia. Um, yeah, but we got 40% population rate and of, of poverty and we've got a tw uh, actually our, our special education student numbers have gone down to 19 percent from 22 percent of the district so but it's still a large number so we should have seen an increase you would have expected it given those two circumstances uh, you know but it is what it is furthermore they didn't think about the implementation so the fact that they don't have this review board put together yet what you're going to see is you're going to see people go over the 10%. You're going to see them go for review. And 
what's going to end up happening is the Ed Fund is going to end up holding the bag here. Yeah, and I, I still wasn't clear if you go in front of review, when when do you have to pay that back? Because it wasn't. Is it the same year? Because that wouldn't be possible if your votes have already gone through. Would it be the next year? They're going to make you take out a loan. What are they going to do? I, yeah, I don't think they know. Yeah, I don't think they do either. Uh, it's it's a. Uh, it's just an odd thing. All right, so this is just a rec recommendation just for fun is that, you know, as we kind of talk about school data, there's usually a lot that you can kind of dig in into it um, a bit. So, you know, it's just in the tops of your minds, you know, if, if you're thinking about this stuff, if stuff is jumping out as you as significant, ask a question, right? Write something down. If it's not something I can answer, I'll go research it and I'll get the data for you. What data was surprising? And this is the big thing because it comes back to our ends is based upon what we are seeing, you know, what are the implications for teaching and learning? Uh, those are, those are the, the hugest things that, that kind of comes out of the data review. Now, we, because when you're looking at students that are taking tests, this year's fifth grade is not the same group of kids as next year's fifth grade, right? And so you tend to see scores jump up and down because it's not quite tracking the same kids from, from year to year. Um, so what we tend to do is we look at overall trends, right? The stuff can go up, can go down, can, can go up. But what you want to see is whether it's trending up, it's trending down, or it's, it's trending e uh, evenly. And one of the things that has complicated that, um, especially in the state of Vermont, is every two or three years, they change either the years in which the testing is given, right? It's no longer ninth grade now for some. Now in science, it's 11th. Um, they've changed the test three times since I've been here, um, right? They went from, from NECAP to SBAC. Um, they changed the Vermont, to, to the Vermont Science Assessment. Um, and they've also, this last year, um, they changed from SBAC to what they're calling VCAP now. It used to be called Cognia. So there's been a lot of changes. So the trends do look meaningful. Um, the tests do seem to correlate fairly well, but it may not be, be perfect because we're looking at data that crosses the dates of these test lines. Um, foundational knowledge ends, we're going to look at the ones that we have data for currently. Um, that's the, the English, the mathematics, and the science. Social studies, life skills, and the arts, those are things that may change depending upon our discussions that we're having. And so we'll get baselines as soon as we finally settle on, on you know, what the data is that we want to be collecting. Um, Current interpretation, right, um, is based upon what the board's end is. And the board's end for English, and these are similar for, for math and science, students possess comprehensive knowledge in a core curriculum in the following areas. In this case, it's English. It's reading, writing, and communication. The interpretation that has existed for a while, right, how do we know if students are actually meeting the ends, you know, the thresholds that we've set? And so what we've said is students achieving proficiency in each grade, three through nine, are within three percentage points of the state average, right, in terms of English language arts on the VCAT. Critical end will also be considered in compliance if it shows improvement over time relative to the achievement threshold. So in some cases, if we're below the state, but we're moving towards where the state is at, we're still in compliance. Right, because this district started out at a very low place um, about five or six years ago. So here is ELA. And so explain what the, the chart means here. And this is the district-wide performance. We're looking at all the kids that took the test in the district. So this is the percentage that met the proficiency threshold. So in 2021, you know, a little bit less than 47% of the entire population of the school hit the hit proficiency or higher. Everyone that takes the test? Everyone, Everyone in the that's district taking the test. that's taking okay. the test. All grade levels yep. that get tested. In 2022, this is where it was. In 2023, this is where it was. We've got an upward trend. And what I can say based upon the slope of that trend line is that every year that goes by, so let me see if I can say this correctly, every year that goes by, 3.9, basically 4% more of the entire student population is hitting the proficiency threshold in ELA. So it's not four kids, it's not four, four it's 4% 4 of our entire population every year that goes by is hitting the threshold than, than hit it the year before. Where do we compare? Lane, can I just ask a question? Certainly. Uh, do you pull out students who are special ed students? This, okay. is, this, this is, is everybody. Everybody. Yeah, okay. this is everybody. Um, I do have data 
um, because we do like to compare how our subgroups are comparing to um, the general population because what you want to see that that was the whole achievement gap piece you want to see that gap closing but is it everybody taking the test or is it a random sampling per grade this is everybody who took our who took the test it was supposed to get everyone to take it yeah so the, the, the federal law is, and this is where things kind of fell apart and trying to compare to other districts during COVID. The federal law is the expectation is at least 95% of your student body is going to take these tests. If you do not do that, typically they, they ding you pretty hard. For some reason, they seem to leave Vermont alone. During COVID, a lot of districts were only testing 30, 40% of their kids. And so when we're trying to compare to them, it, it made it a little bit difficult because we always hit so, the 95% percent. So we hit the 95 Yeah, mm -hmm. we always do. Yeah. There is an alternative assessment for students with significant learning disabilities, but we don't choose that. That's assigned. Yeah, it's, the, the, the team does it, and my guess is it's probably about five kids. In yep. district it's a very small number. So, uh, go ahead. If that trend line continues up, you know what I mean, like, obviously the ideal goal would be to have 100% not achievable i wouldn't think yeah i can explain that so too. where does that kind of where is it reasonable to expect that would top out there's like the yep. there's like the the idealistic goal of getting to 100 percent, which is not going to not happen. achievable where would you expect our district to get to reasonably so uh, i had this discussion in the very first uh first ends report that i did based upon our current resources based upon our demographics and I'm actually going to compare us to the districts around us in the last slide here because it's some pretty, pretty neat data there. Um, we should, at the elementary level, we should be able to consistently hit the 70% mark, which is high for the state of Vermont. And at the elementary schools, at least two of them are doing it consistently right now. They, they, they hit that mark two or three years ago and have been, been holding it up. And they've, they've kind of leveled out, right? Mm -hmm. Right around yeah, right. Um, the high school, my guess is, um, given the resources that we have right now, given the work that they're doing, especially if they really latch on to the behavioral piece and the cell phone piece so the kids are able to focus in class, they might be able to hit 70, but I, I'm going to say <laughs> probably in the 60 to 65 range. Now, there's always limiting factors that control what you can do. The problem with any natural system is that the closer you get to the potential maximum, that 100%, the exponentially more you have to pay to get there. And there's actually a little formula that describes it that I, I crossed over once. Um, and so we used to see that at the other... You get diminishing returns. Yeah, it's diminishing returns. You can do it, but you know, if, it took me, if it took me an extra million to get them from here to here to get the next five or ten points out of them from this point, it might cost two million. And then they get the next five or ten, it might cost four. Mm -hmm. So that's the balancing piece. So, but I would say elementary 70% is more than reasonable. High school, probably 60 to 65, given current steps. So in terms of the state, and again, we're still looking at English. Um, the state is in orange. We're in blue. Two things that are important to see that's going on here. We are above the state. We started out below the state. We did. We crossed during COVID. We crossed the state. So there was a lot of darn good work going on by the teachers during COVID um, because we were advancing faster than the state was during COVID. In fact, the state and the nation was pretty much going down. But even now that we're out of COVID, not only are we ahead of the state, but you see how the gap is getting wider? We're pulling away from them. So we're doing a pretty darn good job. There's a piece that's going to come up later, and we'll see that the question is going to be is, do you know what the event was? These scores would probably be actually a lot higher if it wasn't for a specific event that happened last year. The heat. The heat. Because what happened last year, and you're going to see it in this slide, is that who was affected? High school. High school. They lost a month of learning prior to the test. They only made up two or three days prior to the testing. A lot of days were waived, and then they made up the rest of them after the testing. 
So for the first time, so what, what this chart shows you is how far ahead or behind we are from the state. So in third grade, our students are, are scoring nine percentage points higher in terms of reaching proficiency than the state is, right? 19 points higher. These are down for the first time in a couple of years, um, but it's due to the heat piece. I feel like I've never seen the seventh grade go be above. Do you mean they're more down than they're, they've always been down. Do you mean they're more down than they were? Well, we've been up for a while. No. So it was that dip between seventh and eighth grade. Yeah, like sixth and seventh. And, and we've been death. working on it. Yeah, yeah like and eighth. And then, but then there was always a pretty significant fall off at one point in the middle school. Yeah, it would. The, pri prior to a lot of the work, what you would see is you would see the the scores going up until about fifth grade it was a little drop, and then um, in sixth grade it was a huge drop. It's whenever it would, they go to the. It would school. sit there for a little while, and then it would slowly recover during nine, ten, and eleven. Yeah, it was the middle school, seventh and eighth grade. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. Yeah. Drop. Well, that was why we were pushing at that We're time, having a real middle school concept to try to address some of those issues. But no, they've been doing pretty well. The, we'll talk about where the, the difficulty is. So, so what I've done, just to make a point here, is all right, so what, what they're saying is in this last year, you know, seventh grade was scoring 15 points below the state, eighth grade was scoring eight points below. Um, ninth grade was actually three points above. That was usually the really tough, tough grade for us. Um, I know we can't compare directly. Yep. And I'm, I'm tr breaking your train of thought. So nope, I we're not. For that, but we can't compare directly because they changed tests, right? But... Ah, Those seventh we, graders who were sixth graders the year before were not below the line as sixth graders. Why in the world are they below the line as seventh graders? And it's not the heat. It's, it's not the, the heat. It's the drop. It, it happens whenever there, they move. Fourth and seventh, there's usually an but actual it happens drop. To, like, but it happens to everybody, right? Yeah, so like every all district. Sta like everybody, but, but, but we're comparing to the state, and it happens to everybody in the state. So why is it? Why are our kids so much more, like so much further below because the they, they lost a month of learning before no, taking the test why. to the heat. I don't accept that. You're telling me that a month's worth of time with teachers in their core. I don't accept that. Well, what about the ninth grade? What about, like, why are they above? Why, if it happened to the high school, why are the seventh graders so much worse than the ninth graders? Here's math, which was above last year. They're below two. When you see a constant change like that across the board, it's usually due to a specific event, right? Math did the same thing. I feel like I have seen this trend in our seventh grade year yeah. after year after year. It's not because of the heat. We have a problem in seventh grade. I'll see if it's I can. Every district. You really but if it's every to... district, then why, then, but we're then still we comparing by state. We're like to the state, right? Like if it's every district, I see what you're then saying. we should still be on the average. So I'll, I'll pull right. I'll, I see what you're saying. at the end, I'll pull up last year's data. We can take a look. I'm, right. ha I'm happy All to right. do that because this is this is the interesting things to talk about. But they did one of the other pieces that supports supports the theory here um, is the fact that we did research as part of negotiations one year, and the research showed that on average, um, again, doesn't mean that every every staff member was doing it, but on average. Um, they were missing 20 days per year of school. And it was not due to maternity. I, I screened that out when I did the study and everything else. They, on average, they were missing 20 days of school a year for personal days and sick days. And we threw up on the, the charts, and I probably can still go find them. There is a direct correlation between how many days the teachers were missing and the students' performance on the test. The schools where the teachers were there the most frequently had the highest scores. The school that was in the middle had the middle scores. The school that had the highest frequency of teachers being out had the lowest scores. I remember that. Teachers have a huge impact in time with teachers in terms of, of the students. All right. So it, since these are down from the previous year, it's worthwhile to take a look you know, at them specifically. And so what this chart shows is this is showing on average during each of these years were grades seven and nine to work. So in 2019, on average, grades seven through nine were trailing, each grade was trailing 19 points behind the state. In 2021, this is where they were. In 2022, this is where they were. And then they dropped during our heat year. 
if we take this data point out, these points are in a fairly straight line. Typically, what happens in terms of trying to predict what the future is going to hold is if the data is scattered all over the place, like our, our uh, population was, right, that jumped all around and you got the trend line in there, that means you can't be guaranteed that the trend line is going to continue to go up. Typically, when the data cluster is close, at least for a year or two, you can predict that it's probably going to continue in that same fashion um, in terms of the data. So, no, they're still, you know, on average, they're still catching up to the state pretty well, so grades 7 through 9. All right, same thing for math, right? Same sort of standard for it, right? We want to be within three points of the state. Um, in terms of achieving proficiency. So here are our math scores um, for the entire district. So between 2021 and 2023, um, we see a pretty healthy increase here. Based upon the slope of the line, what it is telling me is that every year that goes by, 7.5% more of our entire student population is hitting the proficiency threshold than did the year before. That's amazing. Yeah. I'd like to, like to get some credit for it in the community. <laughs> uh, but the teachers it should get credit for it because the teachers have done the work. But the two pieces here, so you've got the state in orange. Again, you've got us in blue. And you see the same pattern, right? State's increasing too, but not only are we ahead of the state, but we're pulling away from it as time goes on. Same sort of issue. Look, oh, there's your preschool. Grades three and four. Math is one that would really be affected because ELA work kind of happens naturally because they speak our language and parents talk to them in that language. Math is a little bit more difficult. These are our preschool grades. So in terms of grade three, our, our, our grade three students across the district are scoring 17 percentage points higher than the state. 16 percentage points higher in grade four, right? Grade five is still above 3%, six is above by six percentage points. And you see in that same pattern, seven, eight, and nine, which again is new this year. Are so, you saying grade four is the first cohort of OSSD preschool students? Yeah, when I was adding up when we kind of got stuff started. And now they're in fourth grade. Yeah, so having that preschool does set them up for really good early learning. The um, Folks were actually asking, the state folks were asking for this data, by the way, so that they can go after getting preschools across the state. So I'm going to be sending this to you. So this is the same sort of thing because we had those down years. Um, this down year in kind of 7, 8, 9, we want to see if we can tell anything more about it. And so we did the same sort of chart, and here we are again, 2019. Um, on average, in grades 7, 8, and 9, we were 19 points below what the state was scoring. It has been increasing ever since, even with that down here. Science. Same deal. We don't have as much data on this because they've changed this thing so many bloody times. We only test in science um, in grades 5, 8, and 11. Grade 8 has actually been our, our downfall a lot of times in the data consistently. And so we're taking a look at that class, making sure it's aligned with the proper cur curriculum, um, making sure they've got good skills in there. Um, but you see kind of the same pattern. Um, what science is happening in grade 8 now? They do a combined, um, right? It's a little bit, of, a little bit of life, a little bit of physical, a little bit of, yeah, a okay. little bit of earth, I believe. Um, and then it kind of breaks up when you get into the, 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 the higher grades. We have a disadvantage um, in science when we compare to the state because 50% of our 11th graders go to the tech center and don't have a science class that year. And 11th grade is one of the grades they test science. And amazingly, this last year, the biggest increase in scores, and I can pull those out separately if folks want to see it, was in our 11th graders. They went from, you know, like upper 20s to 43 percent hitting the proficiency mark. So a lot of the work that Vicki Johnson's been doing to try to make sure the kids are meeting all the standards before they go off to uh, the tech center is, is, is seems to be working miracles. 
But here we are, yeah, we're below the state. We're closing the gap, we're catching up, so we are in compliance and we're not above the state at this point in time, but we're closing that gap. Ah, I love this one. White River Valley. And I, 2022 was the most recent scores that I could find. So White River Valley math, um, right? Central is Northfield Williamstown, this is us. These are for ELA and this is science. And so what this chart is saying is that, okay, third grade, White River Valley, 40.7% of their kids hit the proficiency mark. Central, 37.1% hit the proficiency mark. OSSD, 60% hit the proficiency mark. So we can compare to similar demographics to us. If it's highlighted in blue, that means you got first place. If it's in red, you got second. If it's in yellow, you got third. We are outperforming our demographic. So yellow is worse than red? Yellow is, yellow is the <laughs> lowest, yeah. You think well, Williamstown's a fairly wealthy town, right? No, no, oh, no. Sorry about that. No. I thought they're they were. north and they're one of the sending districts to the tech center. They, a lot of them, have, there's a lot of poverty. Yeah, so, but, so anyway, any questions on? Next time I would request that you make red the worst. I was going by the, <laughs> the ribbons. Or, uh, that's what I did yeah, was the ribbons. First place ribbon, second. Third. Oh. Third, 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 third is white, which didn't didn't make a lot of sense. Oh, but on the reports we get, red's the word. Right, red, red is the bad, right? Red. Yes. Yeah. And so I my like green, green ribbon. is good, and yellow is caution, and red is yeah. alert. So the last piece, I and I think this <laughs> plays <laughs> into conversations tonight and why you know I'm trying to compel the board to take a look into what was said here is because um, one of the things that we've been working on as we're trying to develop our, our public relations model is that there's a lot of mental models that exist out there about the schools staff turnover is high the kids are leaving the schools in droves uh, there's positive ones too you know Braintree is a really great place to be Randolph's the place for your kids to go if they have special education needs because they do a really good job with them so there's all sorts of mental models, but one of the ones that has been out there for time out of mind um, is this idea that our, our staff retention is horrible. Um, I did the data last year. I had even the union sit down and look at the names with me and go through it, and they were in agreement. Our turnover rate last year was, depending upon whether you were looking at just the teachers, the entire staff, at June 30th when we did it was between 7 and 9%, which was a third of what the normal average turnover rate is in the nation prior to COVID. So here is what the state is saying, because the state rates this too on their dashboard. And again, I don't, it was, as soon as we get the 23 data, I'll put this up here too, but in 2020, 21, right? And this is when things were hot and heavy because COVID was, was, was blaring. We were in the highest category they have. We were exceeding all expectations in terms of staff retention. In 2021-22, we dropped a, a level to meeting, like most districts did. State stayed at meeting. Um, Central was not meeting. They had no place to go down, right? Not meeting is the lowest you can go. White River Valley started exceeding with us, and a year later, they dropped two places. So if you add this up based upon a rubric, our score was 7, 6, 2, and 6. Higher numbers are better. We are outperforming our demographic in terms of staff retention as well. Which is why when I say, you know, these face-to-face -face conversations and trying to get people to come in and talk, there's a lot of rumor that runs around behind the back, which is normal. That's what people do, uh, accelerated a little bit sometimes by, by social, social media. But when folks can come in and talk and have direct conversations, we get an opportunity to say, hey, why do you believe that? Well, this is, the, this is what I've got. Would you like to see? Would you like to talk with me? And maybe we can start to change these perceptions a little bit. So I'll get off my high horse. I, I appreciate the time. Questions on? Um, where are you getting the data for the this last one here? Directly from the, the state dashboard. Okay. They What they look at is they, they look at the percentage of your district where the teachers have been there for three. What percentage of teachers have been there for three or more years? 
But again, people have got to ask questions. If you hear something concerning, and this is to the entire community, so I hope I'm on tape somewhere. If you're hearing stuff that makes you concerned, sit down, ask for a meeting. We're happy to sit and talk with you. That's all I got, unless there's questions on it. Uh, ends data discussion. That was it. That All was of it. it was together, right? Okay. Yeah. So we need to discuss the need for two recommended policies. Yeah, I had asked, um, let me go back and look at these. I talked to Pietro maybe a week or so ago when these things were coming up. Um, and ask them to create a model policies for them, which I do not have yet. But I can talk a little bit with the board about what they are to consider if it's something that you do want to do. Um, in the last year or so, we've had at least three actual faculty mm -hmm. members and then um, a person related to a faculty member asking for our tech center students to go and do construction work for them. Mm -hmm. um, they're is potential good there and that the kids are getting skills, but it also could look like a conflict of interest. And so I think it would be pertinent to have a policy, depending upon what the board's leanings are, that either says, yes, we, we will allow this and these are the circumstances where it's appropriate, or no, we won't. Um, because that way we are fair when people are asking the questions because we have a protocol to follow to give them an answer and the answers will be consistent. And so that's the first one that's, that, that's been coming up. Um, the second one um, has to do with a state regulations and the law not quite matching. So under the, the state regs, the AOE regs, um, if a student wants to change their preferred name, they're allowed to come into school, the school is supposed to keep it quiet, they're supposed to change their name you know, in the system so that, that folks know. Um, but under the law, until a student is age 18, parents have the right. And so we're potentially going to be bumping into a problem if we don't have a policy on what we do here because as we're trying to get the parents more involved in their, their children's education and opening up the, the Power School portal, which is where all the grades and student information is held, so parents can check in on their students, the last thing we want to have happen is a parent not know that their student has asked for a name change and they open up the portal and there it is. Um, so we need to have a policy in terms of what we should be doing. Should we be telling parents when a, uh, a student is asking to change the names or should we not? Pietro is already working on a model policy for the state. I've asked him to get it a little quicker for us if he can. Um, so those are the two. Um, unless there's questions. I'm just standing up because it's hurt my back to sit, so I apologize. Yeah. The RTCC policy is that something we I'm trying to figure out at what step we are here are we to decide if we think there should be a policy and if so so if there's no policy if there's no policy um, I will not approve any of those requests because I have no way to say that I'm being fair mm -hmm. right which is fine um, no policy, no request. If we decide that we do want to grant this at times, we need to spell out under what circumstances and what the conditions are so that it's a consistent choice when people are asking. Yeah, no, you, I check this box, check this box, check this box. All these things match. I can say yes to you. Go ahead and do it. You may not even want to. You may not I even want to take it on. Be weighing into that. I, first of all, personally, I and way in favor of it just being a blanket no. But I also think that on the board level, this isn't an area, yeah, that we should wade into making this checklist of when it's okay and when it, and when it isn't. Yeah, because po policies, their job is just to make things consistent so every, everybody's treated fairly. Yeah. yeah. So actually, if the board, you know, you don't have to vote on it, but if you guys, as in general, just say, now we're not interested, then I'll tell PHO no and save the money. Yeah. <laughs>
That, I, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so we'll put it to Nika to create a procedure. If there's no policy, you right. have to grant it. I don't. I don't want to be in a position to grant it because it's not consistent. Um, but not having a policy is also a policy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and protocols come from policies. You don't. Not making decisions also making a decision. <laughs> yeah. Right. I so okay. So then I think the policy should be a blanket no. Right. I just think uh, this yeah. is just too because too then if that because that may be Lane, Lane standing, but if. But if it's not Lane sitting in that chair, right? There should be some like our, our community should be able to have some consistency of ex like some ex well, consistent expectation. Not just his call, I, but I really call. don't want to to stretch it out. But I feel like you guys need some examples of what's being talked about. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Like Betty Young went to to RTCC and said, uh, "Would you like? I'll buy the flooring. Would you like to install the flooring? And I'll make a donation to your Arvos fund." And they said no. So the flooring. But it wasn't meant to exploit them. It was like, here's a job. Do you want it? So that's just one example. Or like, I want a shed built, or I want this or that, and I'll, I'll you know, what's it going to cost? I just bought, so, a, I just bought a business, and I want the kids to come up and work there. Right. Or uh, going to, you know, uh, we want a sign made, or we want, you know, can you fix my car? You know, there's these things are pretty regular. They're regular and they can benefit. And they could benefit the, the kids. We just need a way to get that conflict of interest piece out of there if it's possible. Because one that came forward was someone wanted to basically to buy a building and for us to commit the students would renovate the building. And it was just, we couldn't commit to that. No. They, you know, they wanted a memorandum of an understanding for the loan and everything. It was too much, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems so, like a big liability as well. Right. So it's not that we never want student projects that might benefit the community or a community member, because it might be charitable work, it might be good, you know, win-win. That's where it is. It's, it's that it's benefiting the community, right. and if it's done for, I mean, you could also have a second line that's like, you know, there's a there's a 501c3 involved if you think of it's a... Right. But it should it should benefit in a community, the community, not an individual. Interesting. And and the difference there I think is is if it's benefiting the community then it's like a project, right? That the that the kids are a part of and taking ownership of. They're not being hired. That's where I'm this feels very much mm -hmm. like college um, <laughs> athletes. That's where I feel like it's wading yeah. into. Mm -hmm. The so, line uh, is too fine because the intent may not be exploitation, but, yeah, but it's right for it. It, yes, it is. And we do, have, just, we, and we do have a policy that we're not even supposed to be doing things that have the appearance of a conflict that, of interest. Yeah. yeah, great. So there's already a policy on that. All right, let's move on to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to. I think we need to talk about this some more. Like yeah. maybe not right now. Yes, you are a night person. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you want, do you want me to try to have a draft policy? <laughs> just through what PHO polls do. Sure. Because at least that way it's an informed it discussion. It. Something to... I would, I would appreciate to that, that, it, that if he's doing that policy that it somewhere is... That it's, a, that it's benefiting the community and not an individual. Gotcha. Like they did the piece in front of the fire station. Right. That yeah. just That's benefiting the community <laughs> or a, a community building structure, whatever. But I don't... I, the idea of it <clears throat> being like come build a shed at my home. A residential that's, type that's Especially if it's an, an employee, individual. because it looks right. like it's right. favoritism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unless any well, even, even if it's an individual, right? Like, yeah. it could be somebody who has connections somewhere. Yeah. Not a small like town. Come build right? a shed yeah. at, the, <laughs> at the, you know, rec center or rec field, that's going to benefit the community to have a structure yeah. of that nature. There are, yeah. I mean, it's and so there's going to have to be so very specific, very, like, yeah. I'll make a donation for free labor. There, it, yeah. Right, and we also yeah. have other. Well, the the, the, the supplies community. would have to be supplied yeah. by the individual who's requesting the work to be done. Yeah, but it's still free labor. So, it's it's good. But is it this going to run right up against automotive? Like automotive relies on having people get their cars for the students to work on. But they 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 pay for the service. Who gets paid? The tech center. But not the students. But not the students. But they have to have a broken thing to work on. Um, to learn to build, I'm going to be really simplistic here. To learn to build, 
you can be given the materials and you learn to build. To learn to fix, there has to be something broken, yeah. right? So it's a little, well, now I'm, see, now I'm just making yeah, up no, exceptions they, and this is why I didn't well, Unless things have changed <laughs> in the last couple of years, they, they charge for the service. <laughs> just like you well, when you go to the auto important. shop. Um, I really think it's a conversation for another night. Great. <laughs> I well then, um, I, whether or not we have a policy to start the discussion off of next time from Pietro, I'd like it on the agenda anyway right. for us to continue. This. Okay. okay, great. Okay. Um, this down. Um, so, I move the table. Thank you. Uh, board monitoring. Thank a you. second. Uh, all those in favor of tabling monitoring 4.4 until next time, which will mean we will have two policies to monitor. So, be that. All right. All right. Um, the report on the VSBA, I do feel like we touched on a little bit with the health policy budget that's the big thing I, I you know so Lane gave us a little bit of a uh, an introduction Tuesday you'll have a more in depth and we shall discuss again so I don't mean to railroad if you really wanted to report no, out about I lunch okay that. <laughs> great how was lunch it was, it was dry yeah yeah, yeah. um a approval, this is the consent agenda. We have minutes from the regular board meeting on the 11th, corrected minutes from the regular board meeting on the September 13th. Those two can be together, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and the other two need to be separate. I do have a change to one minutes, but it's from an executive session. It just has 2013 on it rather than 2023, and that's his fault. No, that's the one from the week, the month before that it's didn't get pr it didn't make it into the packet. So, um, separate. But the one, the one that is ten eleven here. Oh, wait, ten right? But this is the one previous. We still have to correct the date on it. It was the one from the September. Oh, twenty thirteen. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay, I'm bad. I thought you meant the month. Yeah. It's a good year. Yeah. So you uh, so, want me to check Sam's dates? <laughs> yes, going okay. forward, please. Thank you, Connor. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> Does anyone have any other updates to minutes? Great. I'll entertain a motion to uh, accept those two. So moved. Second? Second. Second. Thank you, Chelsea. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Passes unanimously, so I'm not asking for opposed. Great. Members of the sabbatical committee. You need a board member. We do. We need a board member. Um, there's one. Kyle did give me copies of one of the um, requests uh, from a faculty member, but or from yes. But I don't think that's relevant so in you terms have, of you, if you're going to be on the committee. Or yeah, not. you have to appoint all all the members. So the uh, Sheikwin and uh, Mac yeah. Rebbe, um were the two teachers, and then Melinda Robinson was the administrator that, that, that stepped up. Uh, the teachers were chosen by random from those that were interested. So we need to approve those and also um, appoint one of us. And no decisions have to be made by that committee before like mid-February, and my guess is it's a, it's a, it's a one-hour meeting. We don't approve who they have already on there as far as teachers. We just have to appoint a board member to join, right? No, you're supposed to appoint you, you the appoint, whole You appoint the, the whole committee. Whole I'm okay. giving you a recommendation okay. of who to appoint in terms of those three people. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. That's a good question. Very it does say on or before February 1st, so not mid-February. Who wants to sit on that? Is anyone interested in sitting on that? One one-hour meeting. To to choose the winner. Do we have to make to recommend the board? Like any board. cuts or anything? Like no, but there's more than no one request for a sabbatical. So yes, you, you would be saying no to yeah. some people, but you'd be saying yes to one. 
Oh, I forgot to say that. The, um, I don't want to do there is a, yeah. there is a cost have, for the sabbatical, yeah. right? Because somebody's getting yeah, paid half time to not guy. be here. And then we have to pay somebody else full time to cover their position. That was in the budget. Number so two. how many people have requested three? Three so far. Three through through. Well, they have only until November fifteenth. So. Yeah, two two have put in the actual paperwork. A third one has expressed their intent. I thought in the past it was a first come. Yeah, because it was always only ever one. But I th but I think it was like a stated a stated strategy that was the first person to ask gets it. Right. So is this and the first year we've had more than one person ask? First year like, we've oh. ever had more than one. Yeah. And I think we added language that it's to benefit the district. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was some this says it was contract language, so it was it's something put in right there. We tried to. I don't remember if, it, if they accepted it or not. You'd see it in the contract if it was. Well, how come this says contract language then? Well, the work of this committee would be decide which one is most beneficial to the district. Like yeah. if someone is just taking it because they just want to go on a cruise, that's not as beneficial as. I'm it. supposed to tell them that. I'm Maybe something I'm academic. <laughs> I'm no, very they, tired. They, the, the, commi the committee would decide what it's, you would decide as a committee what you want to consider. You know, is it seniority? Yes. Is it benefit to the district? I is want it? no part of yeah. the yeah. I will do it. I will just oh, do it. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Thanks, Hannah. I, I think you need a motion to report this whole. Yeah. Yeah. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> oh. I'll second. I'm sure you don't want to table this one. <laughs> Uh, we have a, mo a motion and a second so for it to be Melinda Robinson, Rebby Carlton, Colin Sheepa. Thank you. And me. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you vote against yourself? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 To RTCC reserve request. Mm. Yeah. So they um, they're in a position where we had upgraded the high school, um, and now we're in a position to be able to upgrade the PA system within the the tech center. It's a safety issue not to have it, right? In case there's a lockdown call, anything like that, they don't have a real great way of communicating. We're trying to have them compensate right now with with uh, the radios. Questions? Uh, they gave one of the sponsors there at the, at the conference had a cool system. Is there any around um, helping uh, deaf impaired kids with communication? Yeah, so there's the, the flashing light, the strobes you'll see yeah. in the, yeah, because they, they're going to need a visual cue. Okay, so we're, we're being proactive in that. Okay. Yeah. Good question. If it's a safety issue, why didn't you cite uh, EL 2.0 as satisfying EL 2.0 as part of your reason for... We, we have it covered with the radios. It's Are not you? ideal, but it's... Right, but you're asking for this money not only because you need to get the boards of oh, you're, you're but saying... also because it's meeting yeah. the requirement of keeping... The staff staff. And the staff yep. and the students Good point. Safe. So we should be getting that in here in this monitoring report that says global policy EL 2.0. And of course this... Safety. So you're saying for in reason, to add it into reason. Right. Yeah, and let me think right. on the timing of it, of, of when it became an awareness. Something's too. about to shut down Lane. Do you need that? I think that's Heather. It's like I haven't read it for that. Oh, it is. It was the board itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll take, I I'll take a peek. <laughs> Me and Sam. <laughs> I said I'd bring power bars. Was <laughs> there a RTCC? There was. Um, yeah. All right. Valentine's Day, we'll have to really. Um, so, Anna, are you asking for a re request? Well, I'm request? just saying that for me, I, I just think we need to be a little bit more specific to why, you know, oh, well, there's plenty of money in the fund, all right, let's just spend it. But if we want to be a little bit more, the reason behind it is he has to 
keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is in what, one of our main policies. So you ought to be citing that. I'm, so, I'm getting this right. system. I so, apologize for to, that. That to, was to, me. Oh, but he's supposed to be telling you what to put in there. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm asking if you want the request to come back to us. I'm trying to cover you. No, just, just, just amend it so yeah. that it's in there. Okay. So, so to be clear, we're talking. That says we're monitoring, we're spending this money. He's giving us a, a reason. The reason is in order to keep our staff safe, they need to have a decent... Yeah, so this would just be evidence. So it's so it's yeah, it's so evidence move, and it's the the policy. Move with the amendment to include policy 2.2.0. Oh. Which would be, right? Uh, that is unsafe. Yeah. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Whoa, I think Sarah won that one. It's close. Uh, all yeah. those in favor of approving this request? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Great. Um, superintendent's report. We read it. Do you want to verbal? The, there's a, there's incidental um, from our. We meet every two weeks with the union. Um, they are interested in opening up discussions about how conference days are managed. And so I wanted to throw that out to the board to see if the board has an interest in that. I promised them that I would do that. No, that's a management issue. That's how I feel about it. But discuss. There... Don't let me shut that down. <laughs> I also feel like it's a management yeah, issue. Yeah, we can't prescribe that. It's fine with me. It's, it's a potential change in working conditions which would affect their CBA. That's but why isn't I'm this the up. negotiation yeah. problem? Yeah, the, 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 pro, the, the proper response, if that's the concern, is this should be handled in negotiations. Well, but I thought we said that. We did. You, yeah. we did yeah. that, that. They were asking for a half day off before. Was for half days, this is for conference days. Yeah. No, we're, there's, we're not. I, yeah. Yeah, same thing. Conference days used to be a full day off. Yeah, then it did. They feel like they don't have enough time. Day. They need two half days. That's Again, exactly I feel right. like. These things have a time and a place to be brought up, and every single meeting to have this come to us is not the time and place to have this brought up. We also don't set the calendar. I mean, that's not us, right? That is no, but right. like I said, the, the reason it's it's technically a negotiationable piece is because it falls under what we negotiate about, right? Yep. Working conditions, we will be salary, happy to negotiate school that day during so. the appropriate time period. Of negotiation. That that's my feeling, but. I, I want I, I want it to be from all of all of us if that's the case because I'm the one that's gonna they're gonna go back and say you know Millington doesn't like you because he didn't approve it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I appreciate. Is every, it. But are, okay. is anyone concerned with that? So it might help right. if at the meeting when they're there and they're asking it, we say no. We have decided right. as we a can, board. We can say yeah. yeah. Some negotiations. And I did offer to say, hey, you know what we could do, because that was the reason I put the email up on the board. I asked them to negotiate it with us two negotiation periods ago because it was an issue and right. there was no follow through. But I think um, we might be able to work out the language for it before negotiation so that it's sitting there and ready and so that we can just go in and say, yeah, that might, that, that's what but I'd like to spend the time on. All right, I appreciate that. That was it. That's what you wanted for. Okay. Yeah. Um, financials? They're good. We're, we should have spent like 67% of our budgets at both Tech Center and high school now. Off the top of my head, we still have over 80% of both budgets still left, so we are well in the black. Um, there's been a lot of spending out of facilities for a lot of, like I said, older building. Um, so they, they haven't overspent, you know, their budget yet, but they're a little bit ahead of probably where you'd like them to be right now. What's, what's the reason for being so far behind on the budget? Uh, which piece? Like you're saying that we, sh or you just said we should have spent X amount percent by now. Why, why are we so far underspending? Probably because um, we have staff, um, it's kind of like the grants, 
you know, if you couldn't hire staff right off at the beginning of the year, and say we hired them in November, right? We have money there because we planned it out for the entire year, but we lost two months that we didn't pay them for because we didn't hire them till November or couldn't hire them till November. So that's a, a big chunk of it. Does that make sense how I'm explaining that? Yeah. We got money for this much, but that's in the budget, but you didn't come into here, so this is money that's not going to get spent this year. Okay. Would be my guess off, uh, off the cuff with a, a lot of it. Yeah. Other questions? Great. Um, okay, action items. I'm just going to throw some out here. Uh, Anne and Chelsea, please reach out to Ben, if you would. Um, Sarah, you and I have some annual agenda edits to make. Mm -hmm. uh, Chelsea, you and I will reach out to Pietro. Please send any edits to the letter to the community to Katya. Um, please register for the training next Tuesday, the 14th. At the VSBA website, uh, ends committee. Please let's meet and include Anne. Facilities committee. Schedule something with Bob and Wes. The end of our action items. Um, I will entertain a motion to move into executive session, with or without guests. Via. I just have a question about it, though. So we have guests that are missing for the first item. Correct. Are we um, our guests for the second item? Uh, no. So I move to enter executive session um, with uh, Lane and Heather joining us for the first portion of executive session, and then for only for the second part. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's what I'm saying. Moved by Katya. Seconded. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. 10.08, we are moving into executive.